The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey there, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, your gentle host for a gentle listener. And welcome to the show. I forgot the name of the show for a minute there. Big thanks to Luke of the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, listener, for tuning in to another fun-filled show. This week's episode is kind of a first with the show. We first time I've had a guest reach out to me and ask uh, to be a guest. And, you know, he was a very lovely email. Uh, very humble. Uh, wanted to know if he could be in the show. Uh, felt it seemed seemingly like he shouldn't be able to ask this question, but I was very happy to receive it because I'm always looking to talk to people that are out there doing comics, that are doing art, doing anything nerd, nerd adjacent. And uh, yeah, and this guest did reach out and did ask, and I did reply fairly quickly and did say yes. And very shortly after that, I believe the same evening, in fact, we recorded this episode. So a uh, big thanks to Don Watson, today's uh, guest. For, to, for reaching out and making sure this happened because uh, it was a very interesting talk. I mean, I met Don years ago at the East Coast Comic Expo and um, and I've read Devils with him, I think, a little bit of cons here and there, but never really had a chance to have a good, real good conversation with him. So I kind of got into the nitty-gritty of it this week and learned a lot about him. It was really fun. And, uh, yeah, and I learned a lot. There's some interesting stuff about, uh, you know, Alberta, um, as some of us call it, Canada's Florida, I don't know if I would call it that, but some folks do. A lot of people are saying, a lot of smart people, amazing people. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he used to live there and moved, recently moved back out here. He has an independent comic called Jurassic Warp that's for sale on Amazon. The first volume is available. I believe he's working on the second now. And it's very interesting. And you know, we got to get out there and support our local creators who are out there banging the drum and doing stuff like this. And uh, Don is certainly one of them. So uh, that's coming up in just a few moments. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to tune in and, uh, you know, like, subscribe, all that to my sister podcast, to this show, which is called X-Rated, the, uh, the X-Men animated review show in which me and Devin Skelhorn, a former guest, talk about the X-Men animated show from Fox in the 90s, in which we discuss all things about that show, but mostly we watch each episode in sequence and review them. Uh, the episode that will be coming up after you hear this. Ooh, shoot. I just screwed up my timing. Because we're recording that tonight. I'm actually doing this on a Tuesday when I'm recording this. So uh, I'm not sure what the next episode is. The episode that we just recorded last week when you're listening to this will be Beauty and the Beast, which I believe is episode 10 of season 2 of the X-Men show. Very fun uh, program. Me and Davin have a lot of uh, banter, witty banter, if you will. And uh, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, Davin brings the, the sound effects and... Uh, and the, the, the intense X-Men knowledge, and I bring the handsomeness and uh, gentle good humor. So uh, it's a very fun show. We, we have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, it's going on with me this week. I saw Doctor Strange finally. Unfortunately, my schedule has been quite busy lately, and I haven't really had the time to go do it. So I squeaked out a little bit of time on Sunday in between hanging out with my little brother through Big Brothers Big Sisters um, and going to rehearsal for the play I'm in. So in that small window, I managed to squeeze in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And you know what? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was one of the funnest Marvel movies, I'd have to say, has yet to come out. Um, people are complaining about the pacing or complaining about the... Uh, it's it's funny. I remember... I don't know who I was listening to, but some critic somewhere said that like film criticism seemed to kind of fall apart when layman people, like just folks like you and I, would use terms like pacing when describing their, their enjoyment of a movie, which is, you know, something that seems like an industry thing. And maybe that's it. The internet has given us more information than we need and more more tools. I don't know. But uh, I thought it was perfect. I loved it. I thought the story was great. I thought it was a real growth movie for Doctor Strange. Um, it really played into his role in Avengers Infinity War and really amped up what's going to happen next. 
Um, you know, that we really painted him with Infinity War as being the guy that makes the hard choices and and uh, needing to be the guy to make hard choices. And is that really the healthiest way to go about your life? And who knows? Maybe it's not. But it does have one question that is asked frequently in the movie and is almost the center point. And that question being, are you happy? And I think it's something that's very important for all of us to ask ourselves every day and has a nice little... Uh, coda about it at the end of the film as well I don't want to reveal too much, I know there's a lot of information out there and I know most people probably saw it um, however I just have to say I really loved it. it it certainly was unpredictable it moved like any Marvel movie I haven't seen the motivations of the characters uh, the, 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 the essentially movie long chase all of this stuff was kind of new and not really something I'd seen in a Marvel movie before even going so far as to make the you know the 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 set the pieces that are involved in the the final battle, uh, very unique and also very Sam Raimi, which I loved. I, I I really really loved it. I mean I love Sam Raimi. Uh, he hasn't made a movie I haven't enjoyed thoroughly, uh, except I haven't seen Crime Wave yet, and I fear that's not that great. But I've seen everything else I think, uh, except oh sorry, and The Gift. I haven't seen The Gift, which I really want to watch. Actually, it's on my list of uh, movies I haven't seen yet that I really need to see. It's uh, Kate Blanchett, I believe, and it's uh, like a southern. Psychic kind of thing, but yes, that is one I need to watch as well. But, you know, the Evil Dead movies, Astro's Evil Dead TV show, um, uh, I Spit it, No, I Spit in Your Grave, Drag Me to Hell, um, and all those sort of movies, fantastic. I really love his work. Spider-Man, the original Spider-Man movies are great. I even like three, and I know I'm in the minority, but I liked it, all right, so sue me. So, yeah, I'm really happy he's here. I'm really happy he's doing what he's doing, and I really hope they keep him on for more Doctor Strange chicanery uh, in, the, in the coming years, because uh, I really, 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 really enjoyed what he did with it. That was really cool. And something I've talked about in this show before, some some dream casting of mine comes into play, which is really fun. So uh, I don't know if that's too much of a spoiler. I don't know how deeply you're listening to the show or how much you remember something I said a million episodes ago. But it's super cool, and I hope it means more things in that nature coming to the Marvel Universe. But I digress. Because I often talk a lot at the start of these shows, sometimes not so much. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys really need to listen to me talk about my stuff, my problems, you know, what I like, what I don't like. But, you know, I got the microphones, you're going to have to listen. <laughs> it's the price of admission to hear my interview with Don Watson. But you know what, I think you've paid enough. So, without much further ado, let's go into my conversation with creator of Jurassic Warp, independent comics writer, artist, and creator... Don Watson. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Finally, I got it. Sorry about that. That's all right. No worries. Oh, gosh. I went to go open Zoom, and it's like, yeah, this isn't compatible with your computer anymore. <laughs> oh, no. Did you do some updates? Yeah, it, it was forced me to re-download it again. So I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, no worries. 
geez, there we go. And then I, I was like, well, I have it on my phone, but then my, I couldn't find anything to balance it on. So I was using this action figure. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. as you can see, yeah, we're still moving in here. So do you just move, do you just move into Halifax from, from Alberta? Yeah. Yeah. We got here. Well, uh, about just coming up on four weeks, really just a few days short of four weeks, but yeah, we, uh, yeah, we were in Red Deer, Alberta for about just about five years. What prompted the move? What's that? What prompted the move? Oh, um, family. You know, it's you know what with COVID and we we were so far away. We just figured, you know, uh, you know, if we were gonna make the move, we got to do it now. You know, we uh, we had some family that got sick, and just being that far away, we you know it's it's kind of hard to support people back home. Yeah. So we we. Uh, we got chatting. Actually, I kind of put the bug in my girlfriend's ear and I was just kind of saying it off the cuff. I was like, you know, if we're going to go, like we got to go now because Alberta wasn't going to get any better. And the next day she was like, yeah, I, I already talked to them about a transfer. So I was like, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, well, excellent. <laughs> what did, what did she do? Uh, so she, my girlfriend is, uh, was a manager for chapters. Oh, nice. Yeah. So she, uh, and she's a massive bookworm as much as I love comics and video games. She, uh, She's a massive, massive bookworm that way. Oh yeah, she goes nuts. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, so she. Uh, <laughs> so I had the pleasure of uh, putting all our bookshelves together <laughs> and lugging all the <laughs> her thousands of books. So, uh, well, um, I, I have so many too. So I can't. Uh, I can't. When we moved, we bought this house about five or six years ago. And when I packed up, you know, they always say you throw out so much stuff and you move, and I did. But so many comics and books and like I, my dad came up and built a library in one of our spare rooms and uh, it's still like overflowing now. Like I got to oh, either seriously? tear it down or build another library or buy a bigger house. <laughs> it's already a pretty big house and it's just me, my wife and a bunch of cats. So, you know, I don't, oh, I can't justify a bigger house than that. So, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> it's tough i mean the, you have to like stifle the, like the 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 part of your brain that's like you know the the rational part has to like stifle the collector part and yeah. the collector part wins with me all the time you know yeah, every <laughs> <That's>, time <laughs> it's worse when you collect because i collect comics and books uh i collect blu-rays and and movies like uh, or and uh and records so like between all that it just it's all stuff that takes up space yeah so much space well, it's it's insane that stuff you know it piles up so fast like uh prior to us moving out west back in 2017 we uh we were living in moncton kind of moving around and i had this massive basement and of course the inner nerd in me went wild so that was it was just a massive like nerd dungeon mm -hmm. i had captain america shield on the wall i had uh, <laughs> i've got about like this is just my funko stuff i don't even have my action figures out but I've probably got about three, 400 action figures. Oh, wow. And then all my games and stuff. So that was a pain trying to move that out West. So. I had to temper my action <laughs> figures. I ended up going with just like uh, the statues. If I find statues I really like, and that that's oh, my, yeah. my, and usually like just the PVC ones, just nothing too crazy. I have a few expensive ones. Like I have this, this um, legends or not legends. It's the, the replica infinity gauntlet. Oh. Well, the num the numbered ones that light up like it's it's uh, like a statue. I don't know if you can see it from there. Oh yeah, oh that's yeah. cool. So it, it sits on the base, and the base lets it light up. They're going for like thousand dollars now. I bought Seriously. it when I worked. At, yeah, I bought it when I worked at a comic store. I used to get things for cost, so it was seemed a lot more. Um, but yeah, it's a cool it's a cool piece. Oh, I just unplugged it. That's why it's so funny. There you go. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, sweet. it's probably one of my favorite thing. I'm a huge Thanos fan, like massive. So uh, I was like, I have to get that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can see the figure behind you there, too. Oh, yeah. I have a little that top shelf is like a shrine kind of. There's like <laughs> two statues. There's the Holy Legends God. action figure, the chess piece from the Marvel chess set, the bobblehead. Um, wow. Various things. A friend, a friend of mine actually got me. Um, it's on the wall there. Um, the Infinity Gauntlet issue number one signed by uh, Perez and Starlin, which is pretty sweet. Oh, um, Perez signature. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I see the art on it, right? And um, yeah, I guess it's, yeah, he just passed away, which is sad. But yeah, that's, uh, that's insane. So he got me, uh, he also got me, there's like a honeycomb cereal with Thanos on the cover. So for my birthday, <laughs> he got Jim Starlin to sign it at like a convention. So, oh, seriously. There's, there's a picture of Jim Starlin signing it attached to the box. 
oh what <laughs> Thanos cereal which is hilarious it's one of the funniest uh, Thanos memorabilia things they have oh that's sweet but I can to- <laughs> I can totally uh, see what you're saying about the uh, surrounding yourself with the uh, you know your nerdy interests because as you can see around oh. me there's gremlins there's baby Yoda <laughs> back there there's yeah, I love the gremlins. Oh, thanks, man. The the, uh, the flasher <laughs> one in the corner is a pretty. Oh, jeez, I didn't <laughs> see that. <laughs> yeah, it's usually over my shoulder, and I have a, a replica one that a friend of mine. Um, he he does movie work in movies. He, uh, he oh paints. seriously? Yeah, he uh, I I do a bit of acting, and I met him on a few things. But you know, I got the gremlins poster there, and then there's a one of my favorite movies, Phantom of the Paradise. I've you know what that Phantom of the Paradise? I actually. I've never watched it, but I've been seeing a lot of people like talk about it online, Instagram, and it's so creepy looking. I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, <laughs> it's so good. Like, I, I mean, I talk about it a lot. We had, I had a previous guest, a lady from uh, P, well, she lives in PEI, uh, Chelsea Scully, and she has these um, yarn voodoo dolls of like uh, figures. She does custom ones. They're like 10 inches high and they like, they move and they're amazing. Like, the quality is oh. crazy. So, I got her to do me one of the Phantom for the Family of Paradise because, like, one of my favorite movies, the memorabilia of it is pretty. It's, it wasn't like it's kind of a cult movie now, but it wasn't really, mm. you know, didn't do super well when it came out. There's another poster of it on the wall there. If you can kind of make that out, I gotta but see it's, that. It's really good. Do you like Brian De Palma? Brian De Palma, why do I know that name? Scarface. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Scarface, yeah. The Untouchables, but um, he did a bunch of these. Uh, Mission Impossible, the first one. He did oh, a bunch. Wow. He did a bunch of these, um, like in the 80s, 70s and eighties. He did all these crazy, like exploitation kind of movies, but like okay. almost throwbacks, like Italian Giallo movies and stuff. So, like, oh, um, okay. yeah, Body Double and uh, Blowout, the Travolta movie. He did that. Um, uh, the Family of the Paradise is one of his early ones. Um, yeah, Dress to Kill, uh, Sisters, a bunch of like a lot of. Hitchcock homages, but really good stuff. But Phantom of the Paradise right. is like uh, it's like Phantom of the Opera meets um the Faust story, but in like a 70s rock scenario. And the music is amazing. It's all oh wow Paul, Paul Williams <laughs> plays the bad guy. Like um, it's it's a cool movie, man. I definitely suggest checking it out. I had yeah. the uh the joy one time if it was playing in Halifax at the uh the theater, uh, they put it on the big screen, so I got to bring a friend to go see it that way, which is really fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you may. I, this is a word of warning. I'm in my basement, and it's an yeah. old house, so periodically you may hear the furnace explode. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you may hear a ghost wailing in the other room. Yeah. One just well, like appears yeah. behind you, like some spectral <laughs> image, just bleeding from the eyes or something really grotesque. Oh, like... The nun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, Valak is in the house. <laughs> my, uh, I find like when I'm uh, over the last couple of years, like doing these comics and stuff. Like I, uh, for me, I have to watch. It's it's always it's not like I'm even watching superhero movies while I'm getting like into the, like the whole mindset of drawing comics. For mm-hmm. me, it's horror. Like I love seventies, mm-hmm. eighties horror. Oh, big really? Romero fan, big oh, Carpenter me too. fan. Me too. I'm a huge Carpenter fan. Oh yeah, huge. I, for I... some reason, I thought he died, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess he isn't. He's still no, he's, alive. he's still around. <laughs> uh, yeah, every once in a while they tease you that he might do another movie again, but he seems pretty happy just to do music with his son, and that's about it. Yeah, it. Uh, he did pop up in that uh, Dave Grohl horror movie that just came out, the Foo Fighters one, Studio 666. Oh, yeah. It wasn't that, that very briefly, and he did the theme song for it. Yeah, it. Uh, I've just gotten over the last couple years just obsessed. And it's funny because my girlfriend doesn't really know what the heck I'm talking about. So, like, <laughs> we, we drove across Canada. We just yeah. got a U-Haul and hoofed it. And we were coming through. We had left Thunder Bay, had a nightmare trip stop over in thunder bay it was terrible and we well, were like you, you gotta elaborate on that what happened in thunder <laughs> bay well all i've ever heard is thunder bay is gorgeous it's beautiful it's like a postcard town so i'm like oh okay like let's stop in like we've been driving for like you know nine hours let's you know let's stop off the night get dinner so we go downtown we find this hotel and as we're going through the city it really is quite beautiful like up top mm-hmm. is gorgeous it's very picturesque you can see it over the lake and there's like a mountain Uh, it's like it's actually quite ominous looks like a volcano is about to explode (laughs) i'm like i didn't i've never heard of that uh but as you go down the hill it's very visible and obvious the the city starts to decay (laughs) okay so i was like oh this looks weird (laughs) and now we're in like the hub of downtown and we go to this holiday inn i'm thinking it's you know it's a big chain we're gonna be fine Mm -hmm. we go in they're doing renovations 
uh, so my girlfriend and I go in and there's like an old guy who's smoking dope in the lobby. <laughs> I was like, that's <laughs> good, <bold."> start. <laughs> good start. Good start. You know, is this a good sign or not? Like, uh, <laughs> so the, the lady's like, you know, sorry, we have renovations, you know, that whole spiel. I was like, okay. Like, you know, it's not a big deal. Strangely, this is a weird thing. As we were in the lobby, I turned at a TV in the lobby and it's Moncton. CTV mm-hmm. in Moncton and it's like their annual cat show. <laughs> so, <laughs> no one in the, no one around us like really cares. Like, you know, whatever it's weird. I'm like, Hey, yeah. <laughs> that's the East coast comic expo. Like that's where they do that. Like, I was yeah. that year. <laughs> but it was weird. So we, uh, we ended up finding the room was like just heinous, heinous. It was so filthy. It was just like, they, they had a rave in there or something. Uh-huh. There was just like, everything was sticky. There were burn marks on things like in the room happen. that you're staying in. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. God. I, I think we were in the room for about four minutes, and I started to just like weep. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so tired. So, oh yeah. And as we were like, the only way to get to our room, we had to walk through, strangely, like a puddle. Like there was about an inch and a half worth of water on the floor uh, oh in God. the hallways, and just. The, the contractors were just like these teenagers. So they threw their cigarette butts on the floor of the hallway, coffee cups. So Easy. you're actually walking through garbage to get to your room. And uh, is there then, a discounted rate for this? <laughs> oh, no, no, oh. it was, it was steep too. I was like, oh that's God. cold. I like that. There's like a physical manifestation of like the de- degradation of society. Like all the, <laughs> the, the nice part is in the top of the mountain and the further yeah. down you get is the worse it gets. It's like the wrong side of the tracks, like manifested <laughs> in physical form. It was like Snowpiercer, but a town. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I don't want to be at this side of the train. <laughs> yeah. How'd I get to the back of the train? Do I, I have was to eat just, a baby now. Oh, so we, my girlfriend was like, I'm going to go get our refund. Like, and the girl didn't even question. She was like, yeah, I don't blame you. She actually said that. She's like, I don't even blame you. <laughs> Fair enough. It's we, like uh, Hotel California. They're just like, you can never leave. <laughs> oh my God, it was terrible. But the, the kicker, the, the cherry on top was, I had locked the keys inside the truck. Oh, no. (laughs) So I started to panic. My girlfriend, because I'm a panicker, my girlfriend's like, okay, like, let's figure it out. So I started thinking, like, well, I I do have the keys for the back of the truck, and I have my toolbox. So I'm I'm kind of like a MacGyver. I used to do, like, YouTube videos, Mm -hmm. like, of me making random cosplay stuff Mm -hmm. way back in the day. So I'm like, okay, what can I make to, like, get this back? And I actually, I didn't get the door open, but I was very close. I had taken, um, what was it? I had taken the strap off of her purse. It was just mm-hmm. like, it just clips on. Yep. I had taken these, I have like a, like a wall bracket. I actually hang my skateboard on. Just like a kind of a shape of like a U kind of hooks out. Put that, just swung it inside, pulled it, grabbed the handle of the door. But it's such cheap metal, it actually just bent. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah. Did it first try though. I got it well, first uh, swing, but and you gave end, some great advice for people looking to break into U-Hauls and how to yeah. do that. So yeah, fantastic. <laughs> it was uh, well, that was the thing too. There were so many sketchy people around. There was one guy who I'm pretty sure he actually offered to help us break into it, and I was like, yeah, I bet he could. <laughs> yeah, he was sure. just. But sixty bucks later, we had a guy show up, and he was like, "No, I can get you out." And he I'm told surprised he, they would do that for U-Haul because how could you prove it's your U-Haul? That's what I was wondering. Yeah, because uh, we called a local U-Haul branch and they didn't ask for any info. They're like, "Oh, you got a truck? Cool. Where are you? We'll send a guy." Hmm. Buddy showed up, sixty bucks cash, and with a kit that I'm pretty sure you can get from Canadian Tire. <laughs> he uh, opened it up. Have a good day. Oh, and you don't want to stay in this side of town. It's creepy. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, you're telling me." <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh my God. But the <laughs> the follow-up was we uh when we were leaving through there like long after we left thunder bay it was just a lord of the rings expedition we got to this point somewhere in, i don't even where we were in ontario but it was nighttime we couldn't the, the fog was so thick we couldn't see anything like not like we were going probably 50 in a 90 zone <laughs> yeah and everyone's just flying by i can't see <laughs> anything and we're coming through some of these parts that like if you've ever driven across Canada, there's a lot of ghost towns. Hmm. I it's want crazy. to someday. I never have, but I, I really want to. It's yeah. It it's I've done it three times. It's fun. Uh, I'm getting to the point I can't sleep in cars anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting too old for it. 
but it uh we were coming over these hills and the the light from these like derelict gas stations and little like i don't even know what they were i, I don't i don't want to say it was a full ghost town but it was certainly haunted a haunted village <laughs> <laughs> not not, yeah, not ghost but you know there's something haunting and i'm Maybe. over the <laughs> i'm over the steering wheel just watching i'm like what the hell because it was really like the, I had just been watching the fog, uh, the old seventies version. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And my, girl, and my girlfriend's like, "What are you talking about?" I was like, "I was like," <laughs> and I was quoting the movie and stuff. I was like, "They're gonna come for us. They're gonna come for us." <laughs> the sailors oh, lost. Don't pick up any gold, uh, gold, <laughs> gold coins you find kicking around. <laughs> Throw it right back in the sea. Don't do, take it do back. You, do you have a favorite Carpenter movie? Um, it's a hard pick, but oh, you know, yeah. you, if you have to pick one. If I had to pick one, I would say Prince of Darkness is pretty good. I love that movie. I mean, yeah. the, I think the thing has to be number one for me just because it's so good and so rewatchable. Oh, but yeah. I love, I think the Prince of Darkness is one of the ones that most people don't, like that doesn't get talked about enough how good it is and how original and interesting, like bringing quantum mechanics to to uh, horror is. It's, you know what I mean? Like Carpenter yeah. really just sort of injects his interest. And like I had the, I think the Screen Factory release of that on Blu-ray, and they have some interviews with him where he's talking just about how like he was just interested in that at the time, so he brought it into his movie. Um, I think Mouth of Madness is another one that not a lot of people talk about that is fantastic too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Sam Neill is so good in that too. Like, it's fantastic. He, he just like blow. He just blows the top off that movie because I when I was watching that, I was kind of coming down off of a Stephen King high. Oh yeah. So, and it really, I found that was a pretty good bridge. Of books or movies, because Stephen King movies, the good ones are few and far between. Yeah, the movies. Uh, (laughs) And not always good ones. No, I mean, even Silver Bullet and Sleepwalkers and some of those weird-ass ones are kind of fun in their own way. This cat is really, really (laughs) wants attention. Come on, buddy. It's it's funny that, uh, because I I was trying, like, I'll put on, like, when we were out West, like, we got into our own tradition. Like, we didn't know anyone, so we didn't Mm -hmm. party, but we would put on horror movies, eat candy and make cheesy costumes for our dog. And that sounds like oh, heaven. <laughs> it was the best. He's been Peter Pan, Captain Hook, uh, I think a sheriff at one point. So he's, <laughs> he loves it. But Danielle would be like, you know, why, you know, I don't want to watch that. Let's watch something different. Let's watch Casper. I'm like, well, we can, or we could watch Night Flyer. <laughs> <laughs> just... Where did you find Night Flyer at? Cause that movie I've never like, I've never seen it streaming and I've never seen it on Blu-ray oh. anywhere or on DVD. It might be on DVD somewhere, but YouTube. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll yeah. have to check it out because I, uh, I remember watching that movie as a kid and being and really liking it, thinking it was like, you know, even as a kid, I had like, I watched a lot of movies. So even as a kid, I had a respect for that one. Cause I don't know if it's just Miguel Ferreira. He's such a good actor mm. or, um, or the, the subject matter itself or how disturbing the vampire looks when you finally see it um yeah. it's it's just an interesting different movie um but lately i feel like stephen king adaptations have been really taken off like uh mike flanagan can do no wrong in my mind everything he's done his solo stuff and also like his king adaptions like gerald's game mm. and dr sleep is a masterpiece i think it, it to me it holds up That's beside the shining um that was fun that was yeah really fun so one. good and like i mean hill house and a blind manner and i really was high on midnight mass like i told everybody i knew to watch that show like a hundred times and like it's so good go watch it it's like a, <laughs> it's like a stephen king book you didn't know existed that he made an adaptation of it it's what it oh felt. yeah i i think actually i think i was watching it because i saw you talking about it oh right uh, on. i'm a huge fan and i uh it's funny i uh i was diving into it and i i can't remember if it was you or it was i, I think nick bradshaw also posts i don't know if you yeah. have him on facebook but yeah he i do talking yeah. about it I've been trying yeah. to, I'm, I really want to get him on the show someday, but he's so busy. So, yeah, he's, oh God, <laughs> I wish I was as busy as that guy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, he's doing super well. So, uh, he's, he's a friend, but um, yeah, he's just hard to get in touch with. Yeah. Uh, it's, so, oh, or did you start, did you start in Moncton? Is that where you were, where you began or in New Brunswick? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm originally from St. John, uh, mm. St. John, New Brunswick. And I think, uh, I guess in terms of comics, I got started 20, I want to say 2010, but like it really, the younger me procrastination had a different definition. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, uh, it was bad. You know, I just, cause uh, I came with an idea for a comic. We, I was into a web series mm-hmm. and like, you know, looking at a web series or doing one yourself. Like I was, I was thinking about doing one myself. Uh, 
I hadn't even been reading any web comics at the time, but my buddy Mitchell uh, and I, we, we had this journalism class that was basically a bird course. We didn't actually do anything. <laughs> so we just made comics in our, main, uh, our spare time. Is this so, UM, UMB or where were you at? Oh, this is high school. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay. I was going to say, oh, yeah, I, want, I want to go back to the start. So when did you, <laughs> when did you start reading comics and stuff? Like, was that always? Oh, like oh way back then. Um, Let's start the beginning and work away. Baby Don. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> baby, yeah, baby. Tell me a baby Don. <laughs> uh, I think it probably would have been. I mean, I was I, I was into the movies and the shows before comics. I think uh, I have pretty vivid memories of watching the crap out of Batman and Robin, like the, <laughs> George the movie. Clooney. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like uh, just. I remember it. even yeah. as a kid being disappointed in that movie, and I shouldn't have been because it was designed for me. Like I was probably like. How old would I have been when that came out? That was that ninety seven. Yeah, that would have been like twelve or thirteen, and I was like, like even then, like and as a kid, when I just loved anything that had anything to do with comics, because I love oh. Batman Forever, and it's not a great movie, but like when I was a kid, I loved it, and then I watched <laughs> that, and I was like, what is this? Like it was like it was the first time I realized movies could be bad, like really bad, <laughs> yeah. especially ones you're really excited for. It was like quite a disappointing uh, trip for a for a thirteen year old. Can Batman be bad? And it's like, oh, I like. I, I remember see you. <laughs> you missed the Bane swim. I yes. actually just rewatched it. Oh yeah, awesome! Was- I've been thinking about going back because I used to really dislike the Tim Burton Batman movies when really? I was younger, just because they didn't feel like Batman to me. But I kind of feel like as a movie fan. I would appreciate them more now, like especially the second one, because it's like a weird German art house movie, Batman Returns. Like it's a strange movie. But um, I, I feel like, you know, like Danny DeVito and, and Michelle Pfeiffer and like the costumes and all that stuff. Like I feel like I could get into it on a level I probably couldn't appreciate when I was younger. Yeah, it's. So was it Batman for you? Was that. Yeah, like- Batman for me was a big one. I, I remember uh, 97, 98, 99, like religiously wearing the batman costume like and the costumes for kids back then it was just like the like basically that onesie that ties it like a shoe yeah. on your neck yeah. <laughs> and then like strangely they remember how the mask like it was a full it was like george clooney's mouth too it yep. wasn't even like oh yeah for your mouth <laughs> little tiny slip for yeah. let's not let breathe. the kids breathe <laughs> that's yeah. not important for their halloween costume it uh i mean i wore the crap out of that stuff and i just i i was off the walls actually i still have this is actually really crazy because over the years i got really into collecting action figures Mm -hmm. and there's a store in saint john uh second spin they used to have a lot of action figures at the time and they had in the box still it was it was open like batman was missing his like cape and utility belt but it was batman with the uh the batwing Oh, from yeah. that old Tim Burton movie. Yep. In the box. And I'm like, oh my God. And I think it was like five bucks. And I think they retail, if I had the cape, it'd be like a hundred bucks or something. So I was really? like, <laughs> I'm up. <laughs> I love toy collecting for that because it's never been my scene, but I know enough about it. And I love that it's like, you know, this is the most ultra rarest toy in the world. Oh, but yeah. it's it's missing this tiny accessory. So it's worth five dollars. <laughs> But if you yeah. had that accessory, this would be worth six thousand dollars. You know, like <laughs> it's just always such a huge jump between like what the value is versus what you know oh, that stuff. It's so annoying that it's yeah, it, it's funny because I have a I got a Funko. Uh, I got really into Funko, as you can see out in Alberta. Mm-hmm. I had nothing else to do, so I uh, I found this Batman one, and I was looking at him like there's a speaker in the back of the head. And I was like, I've got a ton of Funko. I've never seen this before, and it turns out if because it didn't come with the box, if I had it, it would be like 150, almost 200 bucks. I'm like, but I got it for like three dollars. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. he'll sit with the rest. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have a few. I, I gave. I used to collect the Rick and Morty ones, but then they kind of blew up, and it was just too many, so I didn't yeah. bother anymore. But I remember I have a couple. I have to find those that were worth something because they were like the the Rocky ones. Like I think it was like Apollo Creed and Ivan Drago and a few of those that were like out of print or something or hard to find and mm-hmm. i bought them at the dollar store years ago but a friend of mine that collects them was like if you still have that in the box which i don't think i do anymore he's like you could get like a few hundred dollars for that i was like ah yeah maybe. You know, yeah, yeah. Ah. some of them go crazy i know it's Absolutely. nuts i mean i think some of the early rick and morty ones i have might be worth something too i should look into that because i'm not super married to keeping them yeah, um, sell them <laughs> <yeah. laughs> treat sell yourself them. <laughs> 
So were yeah. you like, so was it like did the love of Batman, the movies, and I assume you're watching the cartoon and stuff. Did that lead towards the uh, the comics oh, that way or? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I was, I was your typical like nineties kid. Just like, I loved the shows. I love street sharks and turtles. <laughs> That's a deep. Uh, oh yeah. I, I remember. I always love street sharks. They just, the idea about that whole, <laughs> like anytime those sharks would like run in to save anybody, the amount of infrastructure damage that town would like, they'd have to repave the street every time. <laughs> it would be a nightmare. A it's nightmare. Getting to the crime scene. They <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they just go under underground and just tear, chew up the street all across the city. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, forget it. <laughs> yeah, no, don't bother. Just let them rob the bank. It'd be worth less. Yeah. Fixing up the streets. Well, it's funny. Uh, my grandmother back in the nineties, she got me this bar of soap and it had this great big chunky pimp quality ring. That was a street shark. It oh, yeah. was just his head on a ring. And I went to the bathroom and just like was shaving that thing down under hot water for about three hours. <laughs> to get to the uh, ring. Just to get to the ring. <laughs> just ripped it out. Probably could have broke it in half. <laughs> <What the hell? laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been a better idea. That's amazing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, and my my nan was actually really influential in getting me into comics. She mm -hmm. uh, she she had some my my grandmother. It's I'll try and summarize her. She's a very sweet woman. I love my grandmother, but she she tells a lot of tall tales, mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of them I don't really under like. I'm only starting to question now. I've always believed it. <laughs> yeah. So like like for example, uh, and my girlfriend's the one who popped the bubble. I always thought like I've I've only gone fishing once and caught a fish. Mm -hmm. I was five. I was like in those, like those storm canal, like kind of drains under a road, like not in it, but like yeah. hanging off the side. And I had a dollar store fishing rod and my nan had taken me out to go fishing. I had up until about six months ago, had believed with all my heart, I actually caught a fish <laughs> and she, Danielle is laughing. She's like, no, you idiot. Your grandmother bought a fish, put it on the line and made you feel good. Cause you're a kid just making some core memories here. And I was like, what else isn't true? <laughs> <laughs> Am I not a special little prince? <laughs> Am I not a great fisherman? Yeah. <laughs> and she, uh, the same thing with comics. She, I remember this one time, like when we were kids, we had eaten spaghetti and she had this great big carpet in her apartment. We spilled the, because we we're like four or five, spilled the whole bowl on her floor. According to her, she had to have the whole carpet actually ripped up. Mm -hmm. And supposedly under the carpet was a stack of comics. <laughs> It's a strange lie, but mm. it could be true, I guess. It's just weird. But it was... I mean, I'm sure any <laughs> reputable carpet layer probably would leave a group of comics underneath. <laughs> also, they would be, like, mangled because of people walking over them over the years. Yeah, Although it's nice good. that she turned you destroying your carpet into a, uh, a nice way to give you comic books. Yeah, she. Uh, yeah, she's always kind of <laughs> spinning some yarns that way. I, I, it's very strange. Oh, that's she, cool. Uh, she uh she's really the one who got me into it and you know i had uh it was i can still remember it was west coast avengers uh i think there was an x-men one in there i can't remember it was it was you know the night late 80s mm -hmm. early 90s era back issue stuff but i remember the, the the coolest one i had was this hawkeye issue and it's one of hawkeye's earlier kind of solo runs mm -hmm. And it was so gory. I remember as a kid, it was like this, like, who is this guy? This guy's a madman. Okay. <laughs> oh, it was, I got to find it. It was such a cool issue. He was like being hunted by these like mercenaries in the winter and the snow up in the yeah. mountains. And he was just like sniping people from a tree. <laughs> I was like, this is cool. <laughs> I was like, I uh, the like 90s Hawkeye. was that period where they turned everybody into either the Punisher or uh, Wolverine. Like everybody yeah. had to be a dark character. Like, you know. It was dark. <laughs> those it's funny. were dark. It's funny the things you remember from those early comics. Because I remember, like, I had a stack that my brother either had or I got from people or I may have bought a rack. And I remember I had a West Coast Avengers comic. And there was an episode or an issue where about Tigra. And I don't remember much about it. But I remember her going around basically coming on to every Avenger. <laughs> then them all turning her down. And it was, like, very <laughs> sexual for, like, a comic that, you know, a kid would probably be reading. And I remember not really understanding it. The older I got, understanding it a little more. But then, like, I want to go back and reread the context because to me, it just seemed like she was literally just at, like, going room to room 
hitting on every male Avenger <laughs> and then getting shot down and going to the next one. Oh, um, yeah, I know. Like, I, I have to go look it up because I remember it sticking in my head thinking it's such a weird, like, th- like at this point, it's a kid for, it's a comic for kids, really. And it's yeah. like, you know, it, it, these are issues I don't know if I should be uh, like understanding or realizing at this age. <laughs> it's a little yeah. advanced. It's, yeah, some of that, the, the 90s, what was it my buddy was saying? He's like, you know, there was a golden age of comics, silver, bronze, and then the dark ages. <laughs> yeah. um, eh, I think there's a uh, reason. <laughs> some good stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I have reverence for some of that stuff just because I grew up with it. Mm. Like the clone saga and all that. I actually kind of like, although I know it's a dumpster fire. It just like <laughs> as a kid, it was just so exciting and different. There's a new Spider-Man, and then you had that cool Scarlet Spider with the blue hoodie, and you know you got all his stories, and then you had all this stuff. But then it got too much; like they just went overboard with it because it was popular. Oh. And all the lenticular covers and the, everything, everything <laughs> was shiny and glue in the like glow in the dark. All and, graphic. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember like the head of one that was a Ghost Rider comic with like it would it would like glow it would glow in the dark. It was like his head in flame. But if you held up the oh. light of a glow and then they had a Venom one, too. And I think it was one of those at one point they had all those Venom miniseries. He never really had an ongoing series, but it was just oh, yeah. miniseries after miniseries. <laughs> the Lethal Protector. Or something yeah. Like that. And then yeah. There's, that was the first one. And then there's like separation anxiety. And then there was like one where he, they just would throw a random other person in the series and do like a, a three parter. Oh, there was yeah. there was like one where him and the Punisher teamed up and there's one when him and Wolverine teamed up and there's one of him versus uh juggernaut which is the whole story and like it was just a bunch of that everything just you know one after the other there's some yeah there are some pretty i got some weird back issue ones where and that it's a cool thing but also the annoying thing is because they're so old it's like Mm. good luck trying to find the rest of the series oh yeah yeah but you have to uh, find a trade somewhere that might collect it all that's about the only way you can do it just hit up ebay (laughs) just (laughs) pretty much something like there's some really weird ones out there but uh there's a two-parter one, I think, from the early 2000s. Marvel did called, I think it's called Ruins. And it's... Oh, yeah, yeah. The one where it's like the end of the Marvel Universe where everybody's dead, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's really, like, it's like, it's it's sort of set in, like, I don't want to say, like, a realistic world, but, like, it kind of is. Like, it's, it's just so bleak and dark. And yeah, grim. it was, like, I think it was, like, Marvel's, but kind of, like, the next step where, like, they did, like, the, I don't know if it was, like, their version of Kingdom Come or whatever, the DC yeah. movie, but... Uh, it's it's fun going back. So it, like this is aging me now. I mean, how old are you? Uh, Thirty in October. <laughs> oh, okay. I was gonna say I think you're a bit younger than me. I'm 36. So, um, the uh, I remember like looking at those books or in the back, like they they would come out with these catalogs to order comics. Mm. Um, this is before like I think Wizard might have had some stuff on it. Wizard magazine maybe where I would have read about that stuff. So I remember seeing ads for that sort of thing. So it's always like all this mainstream stuff and then like a mild interest in all this indie stuff that was like Cerebus and that sort of stuff that was coming out that I, you know, didn't really have access to just buying comics off a rack somewhere. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I know it's funny that wizard, I have a bunch of wizard issues. Yeah. I, I got in. It. Yeah. I got into wizard quite late and I, I feel it kind of sucks because I was actually quite bummed out when they went under. Mm. And uh, I remember one of my sprees of, collecting action figures i was getting this toy and it was archangel mm-hmm. from x-men and it was quite obviously like a repaint like mm-hmm. someone had customized this but like very very well like they did it like you almost couldn't tell that it wasn't really? factory oh cool and i was like talking to the buddy uh who owned it and he was like oh yeah he's like uh this is one of my old toys that like, you used to be able to send these apparently according to him he's like you could send your, your toys to wizard and they had a guy that would customize them for you oh really like, like what <laughs> like, that's a really weird job <laughs> even like just it's like kind of a golden age in that like you know with the internet you can just sort of you know get in touch with almost anybody somehow but like back in the day you would have had to mail that to wizard yeah. wait to get it you know wait months to hope that they got it and then get it back <laughs> you know it's uh it was a really strange time like i love talking to comic people that you know got busted in the business like in the 80s or the 70s when like you literally had to like go to New York and then like go to the Marvel office with your stuff (laughs) and maybe see Stan Lee over somewhere, like talking to somebody and then like get shot down by like, you know, Jim shooter or something and be told that you should see, I get out of here or go to a con and like, you know, go meet somebody that's like, you know, uh, you know, like a Perez type or somebody like that that's in the industry and then hope that you can get their stuff to them. And, uh, wild, you know, 
Yeah, it's very strange. It's, but you uh, know, things have changed so much. Like well, just access is so much easier now than it ever yeah. used to be, right? And, it, uh, it, yeah, that's that, that's so true. You know, it's I remember being a kid. Like I never, I was in high school. Like, this wasn't even that long ago. Like you know, the the start of the MCU was kicking in. I remember before Marvel got bought by Disney, they used to be quite open to submissions. Like oh yeah, uh, they even I remember vividly remember seeing like they had us a, a part on their website like in their submission stuff yep it even said like we'll buy characters that you create we'll buy them right off you yeah and you know and now it's like you know don't call us we'll call you it's like uh, yeah oh. well, yeah. well it's, <laughs> you, you think now with the, the the sheer volume of things they're putting out that they'd be you know eager to try new and interesting things or develop these sort of things but oh. even like there's a story too, because even I think someone sued Marvel back in the day because they had some kind of a costume or a, an art contest where somebody drew the black suit Spider Man and sent it in, and it was oh. like I, I was some I have to look up the story, but it was something like that, like some random oh. fan just did that, and then I know shor- what you're talking about shortly after they introduced him in the comic and the kid the guy like sued them or something or or maybe he was just a kid and he couldn't I can't remember but something came out of it that like it was very apparent. He sent this thing in as an art contest, like design a new Spider-Man costume. And then Marvel just took it and then I put it in the <laughs> comics. And then of course led to Venom and all this other crazy stuff. But it's um oh, yeah, it's insane <laughs> to think about now, like these creators that that created like even I think I brought this up before, but even uh, you know, Ed Brubaker, who created the Winter Soldier, like essentially, mm. like he didn't create Bucky, but he created the Winter Soldier and everything about him that makes him cool and that people like. And now, like, you know, he gets no extra money for that. He just wrote the comic back in the day and got paid for that. But now yeah. he's, like, in movies and miniseries <laughs> and making millions and mil- like hundreds of millions of dollars with this this character. And he's not seen. I think Marvel, apparently, like, they say that Marvel gives them money. It's it's basically, like, thanks money, hush money, in a sense that, you know, it'll cause any problems. Here's, like, 30 grand or something. But it's, like, yeah. you know, it's enough to, to keep people from causing a stink. But, like, like Jim Starlin doesn't get extra money for Thanos and look what they did with him. Like, you know, it's like, I know there's contracts and, you know, you can get dicey when you get into that stuff, i.e. Alan Moore, but uh, so, you know, any of that, like <laughs> they're, they're trying to keep everyone happy, but it's such a weird, like, you know, I can really understand why creators would be more inclined to want to go to image or somewhere where you own everything you create or not create oh, anything very interesting or new for Marvel, <laughs> because if it takes off, you're not going to get extra money if it becomes a movie series. Well, that's just it. It's, you know, it's shocking. You know, I I know right after Stan Lee died, like I was seeing some, I didn't follow it, but like I saw a lot of, a lot of headlines about, you know, his, uh, his daughter was looking to sue Marvel. Oh, she's and crazy, I, man. She's nuts. Is she? you, oh, uh, oh. I, <laughs> for, well, I mean, I don't, I can't say that. And if I say it's not fair for me to say that, but um, I read like, I read that book that Abe Rieslin put out, the true believer book about Stan Lee. Oh and, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't fault like I, I love Stanley dearly um, and I and I don't fault his uh, don't fault him for whatever he did. Um, I do think there is some veracity to how much he had actually done compared to how much is depicted as what he had done. But mm-hmm. I know, it's you know, Jack Kirby and some of those guys aren't necessarily much reliable narrators either. Um, but in the book, they talk about his daughter a little bit and she sounds like out to lunch, like 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 just gone. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, that might have something to do with it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, whether that's true or not, but it's like, I think she agreed to give the guy some information then found out he's writing a book and caused a big thing. And then like, well, said she's going to write her own book. And, you know, I think she's just sort of, I think she's been spoiled her whole life basically. And, oh, you know, <laughs> you're, if you're, you're growing up and imagine growing up in that world, you know, even just Stan Lee's yeah. your dad. Like you come yeah. down to dinner and it's like Stan Lee's just sitting there. <laughs> hey there, true believer, pass the potatoes. <laughs> he finishes dinner, slides a plate, excelsior, yeah, and just exactly. walks away every night. Well, it, the, the, the yeah. book really seems that like to to indicate that he really wanted to be a what I was saying quotes as a, a true writer, and he didn't never release really a comics or him getting the respect of being a real writer by doing comics. Um, I've heard and always, that always tried to go on to do other things, but could never really do it. And uh, but I don't know. Like to me, it's like, look, you have hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. I assume he did. I don't know how much money he had, but you know, I think life did you pretty well. <laughs> you know, I mean, but for some people, it's not enough. I mean, you're a creative type as well, so you can understand that you always want a little more. You always want to get a little higher, or get a little more successful. So yeah, you know, I think it's. I mean, 
who in this industry has made more of a mark than Stan Lee? You know, like no, hundred percent. Yeah, you know, it's you know the guy. It's funny because you know I like over here. I'm looking right now. Like I, uh, for some bizarre reason, to all my friends, they're like, "Why do you have these?" I have like almost every season of The Incredible Hulk from the '70s. Oh, it's great, it's great <laughs> and, show. <laughs> I have even the two movies that they've made. Oh, uh, yes. The, de- the Trial of the Incredible Hulk and The Death of the Incredible Hulk. For a they're, and they're amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, and even way back then, he's he's cameos and all this stuff. Like, and he's he's been there since day one. And, you know, it's, he's, he's his prestige is generational. And it's, uh, I, I, I know what you mean. Like, I, I, I've heard some things, you know, like he didn't do this or he didn't do that. And I'm like, you know, uh, I take it with a grain of salt anyway. So I'm like, you know, I, I have a hard time believing everything he made, like was a knockout. Like, (laughs) yeah. A lot of it seems to be like the, the artist would draw what they wanted, leave no speech balloons and Stanley would go put it all in. Yeah. So that, that's mostly what it seems to be. Although sometimes it would be like, well, we, we put, you know, in the sides, what I wanted the speech balloons. And sometimes you'd use that. Sometimes you would add to it. Sometimes you would change it. Like, regardless, I think it's like a, a peanut butter cup scenario where it's like you got like yeah. chocolate in my peanut butter and vice versa and made something <laughs> better because of it so yeah yeah it works for me oh I, I, i'm happy <laughs> i'm you know just happy that the stuff is out there so oh yeah it makes me happy too so when so high school was when comics started you started deciding you wanted to do comics yeah i mean i you know i was always drawing i was always doing little things fiddling with things like i guess I, that was the first time I took comics seriously. I re- like, you know, really want to get into them. I had done like little things like as a kid, like I print, I, uh, I remember I drew this comic, which was totally, you know, not a rip off of power Rangers. <laughs> it was the sea Rangers. Ooh. <laughs> uh, like the power Rangers in the ocean. I think that's actually a pretty good idea. You yeah. Should dust that one off. I'd, I'd read that. I thought about, I was like, I could go back and do this. I don't think they've actually done that one yet. <laughs> like fighting pirates and stuff. That'd be great. Kind of. Yeah. I think and they, like, they form to make a big boat. That'd be really <laughs> cool. Oh man, I'm down. Sign yeah. me up. <laughs> it, uh, I, I might go back and rewrite it. It was pretty cool. But like, I, as a kid, like I was like nine. So I was like, you know, how do you make a comic? So like I, and it's funny. Cause like my, my whole pattern of making comics really hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. the way i like the whole like groove i have to get into before i start like i put on a movie or a show that i love and i just it kind of puts me in the mindset i was doing that like at seven eight nine ten years old and i still do it like <laughs> at 30 now so it's like uh you know i i would only get so far though so i would draw you know it'd be like a five page comic and then i would photocopy it and go to my neighbors and sell it for a quarter <laughs> and then they'd be like oh it's very good and just like <laughs> You know, but it was it was high school that really I Mitchell and I and Mitchell was more of the writer and I was, you know, I had ideas, but he kind of took the ideas and ran with them. And mm-hmm. he was really influential in getting me into writing again. So we had teamed up and then we came up with a couple issues of this comic called Liquid, which is about an alien <laughs> who he has very similar traits to Wolverine, meets the terminator he's like liquid metal uh crash lands on earth but he has no memory of like where he came from and he's trying to kind of piece it all together so we did three issues of that the first one we were actually debuting at HarborCon, which i actually that's where we first met was right. HarborCon then which was <laughs> that was that 10 was years ago. harbor confusion yeah Man, was that 10 years ago yeah god the, the biggest memory i have of that is what was the i sat on the zomb was it the zombie panel <laughs> Uh, they had like a zombie survival panel. I did a comics one with Nick and then I did the zombie survival panel. And I remember we're sitting there and me and uh, my friend Kale Harding. Do you know Kale? Uh, oh, from, I From St. John. So. Yeah, K&M yeah. Comics, he does that. So um, say so this one guy was like, what about, he was like, he, I think I was just there for comedic relief, I guess. But this one guy was <laughs> like, what about if you built like a, a a moat around your your home where you're staying when the like if the zombies are out there and you filled it with like like flesh eating scarab beetles and then like you could use that to like kill the zombies when they came? There's a dude in the <laughs> audience and I'm like, are you like a James Bond villain? Like, what do you <laughs> like? How do you have access to millions of <laughs> flesh eating scarab beetles? He's in the audience. He spins in his chair. Bring <laughs> yeah, the beetles. Yeah. He's stroking a cat. <laughs> you know, just. What about, what about the Beatles? Beatles? Yeah, exactly. 
have we tried that before? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, anyway, Hermacon, yeah, so liquid, yeah. That was, yeah, and it was, you know, that was, a, it was my first convention I'd ever gone to. And it was small, it was intimate, but very charming. And, you know, I got to meet creators like you. I met Nick Bradshaw, who, if he is listening, he still has my USB stick that he said he would review my artwork on and never got back to me. <laughs> that son of a bitch. <laughs> Nick Bradshaw, you fucker. You can give Don back his USB. I need it back. It was two gigs down. I'm literally, I'm literally gonna when I put it on social media, I'm gonna tag him in the in the in the I'll be like and find out why Don wants his USB stick back from Nick Bradshaw. It's yellow. I'm sure you have it. <laughs> it had a lot of really bad artwork on it. <laughs> You know you have it, Nick. Yeah, he's like, you'll never get it back. It's mine now, you son of a bitch. He's probably using that in his portfolio now. Okay. He's getting more work on That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I remember I was so nervous, too, to go up to, to Nick Bradshaw. I was just like, I was like 19, going on 20. I had, we, you know, this is our first kind of time doing this comic, mm-hmm. in which we had rushed. Uh, you know, our whole process was... It was, you know, it's amateur. You know, we were, I was drawing things by hand on loose leaf or no, not loose leaf, computer paper. Ink, uh, you know, I might go over it with a, like a, uh, like a big pen to mm-hmm. ink it. <laughs> yeah. And then just scan it and color it in like a rip off of Photoshop, mm-hmm. which is practically paint, like this version I had. Uh, and we were rushing so, like, we were just so excited for the convention. We, I don't know, like it, for guys that were so excited, now I'm thinking back on, like we didn't actually prepare for it at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so like Mitchell and I, like we were like, okay, what do we do? We got to, you know, we have a table. Like, so we brought like, you know, our laptops that had a slideshow of the comic playing. I was like, that's good. What else do we need? Oh, we should have like, you know, some kind of like a stand behind us with like the title of the comic on. And he's like, do you mean like, do you want to write it on? He's like, how are we, like, it's just like kind of stupid. I was like, no, we're going to go one step further. I'm going to take, uh, and cut intricately this poster board, like those ones that actually like fold out. Mm-hmm. We had it taped to two broomsticks, which were then taped to two pylons <laughs> sitting behind our table. I think I remember this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do remember this. I remember uh, thinking that was very inventive. <laughs> we <laughs> that thing was so wet with paint because we had <laughs> we were still painting it that morning. You like lean against it, get all over yourself. Oh yeah. no, <laughs> we had. Uh, Mitchell had come over to stay the night so we could finish a comic. He was going to letter it. I was just getting, as I was finishing one comic, like like one page, mm-hmm. he came in, you take it, you letter it. He would do, okay, I'm done next. Just, and we just had this little system going and got the comic done late that night. The night Didn't before have, the convention? Night before the convention. Just like run to the printer in the morning and get them printed? Like, yeah. Uh, we, we just, um, I think we did posters instead. Okay. For some reason. I don't, yeah. It was just like the cover of the comic. And we, here's some posters, you know, have one. And then here's a free, you know, you look at it free here if you like oh, to yeah. go to our website. Cool. Uh, and, you know, it, it seemed to be successful. Like we, you know, we got like, I want to say we got like a few hundred hits on it or something mm-hmm. at the time. Like it's nice. You know, it was for us, we were like, wow, this is amazing. Like people actually read it, uh, you know, and we did, we did pretty well, you know, at that convention. And it was such a huge learning curve because I met, uh, do you know Jim Hashi and yeah. uh, Paul Beal? I'd like, to, yeah. I'd like to have him on this someday too. Yeah, hey, I he's uh, a cool guy. I did some co- uh, coloring for him for some of his, his book really? covers back in the day. Oh, the Manga Ganda one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that. That was a good work. Yeah, it. Uh, it's funny, you know. Uh, Jim, I met Jim and I met uh, Scott, and they had a table right across from us. And they liked our stuff. We liked their stuff. And Jim and Scott really became kind of mentors to me. So oh, we would. Scott's a really cool guy too. Oh yeah, he. Uh, I love. I love seeing his rants on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, he's just. He's just like. He just has so. His quips are so good. Like he's just so cutting. I'm like, I love. Him. Oh, like, he's yeah. very, very, very smart guy. <laughs> he, uh, you know, and we would meet up. We be- it became kind of a tradition of theirs that they kind of welcomed me into the fold where we would meet up at Heroes Beacon up town St. John and just. Mm-hmm you know, uh, work on comics together, share what we're working on, just chat about it. And, you know, from Jim, I learned all about inking and I got into inking. And it really, after that, you know, uh, I owe a lot of where I'm at now to Jim 
to Paul, uh, Paul Beal and to Scott, because these guys really took me under their wing and got me into the whole indie comic scene, like, like full on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, very quickly after HarborCon, I was starting to do some issues for, for Jim, for Paul, um, some Western stuff, which I discovered I suck at drawing cowboy hats and I suck at drawing horses. (laughs) (laughs) Two important things in cowboy comics. <laughs> it's kind of a, it's kind of a staple. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things you should be able to draw. Yeah, guns, you know, <laughs> uh, cowboy hats, boots. Are, seems important. <laughs> I'm like, how do I draw uh, braziers? It's like yeah. <laughs> on, on a local yeah, saloon hussy. Right, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, you know, uh, it. I was finding myself. I was getting. I was really starting to challenge myself, and I, I would look back on my achievements and i was so proud but like now i look back i'm like oh god it looks it looks terrible you know it was smudgy pencil work uh because i was just doing everything on like 11 by 17 computer paper mm-hmm. and then just taking it to jim's house here you go never saw them again <laughs> until the comic got printed and, you know uh but i it was just incredible to see something that you've made and it's in print yeah and it's for sale and you know it's just it's such a it's such a thrill, you do, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, uh, as I went on after HarborCon through college and stuff, uh, I kept doing small little comics, like nothing crazy. Like I, I did an anthology one. Mm-hmm. So I had like three or four stories, like sci-fi and fantasy or whatever, and, you know, uh, it was around that time I started to make the transition from traditional pencil and paper to, you know, I'm going to start getting into digital stuff. Like it's just, it's easier, it's cleaner, you know, I kind of, I can cut out a few middlemen by doing it, like, Mm -hmm. I can kind of learn to do it myself, and, you know, I got a, (laughs) it was, it was a learning curve, that's for sure, you know, doing digital was not as easy as I thought, it was, it was hard. Yeah, (laughs) I was thinking about trying it myself, um, because a friend of mine has, like, a tablet that he wants to sell me, and uh, it looks nice, and um, I, at work, I have a, like a student that's uh, in there once a week from high school that wants to be a graphic designer. So she was playing around on one and I was looking at it and I, I played with it a little bit. And it's pretty cool. Like it's, you know, I do like the idea of maybe doing it in pencil still, but I think maybe scanning it and doing all the inks and everything that way might be in the color might be where I'll go. Yeah, like I uh, actually was drawing right before we hopped on. I actually just used my girlfriend's iPad mini. Yeah, I do have an iPad. I thought about trying just doing that, getting the, the nice pencil that comes. And it's like, you know, I find like for me, because like when I was doing things traditionally, I'll just kind of show you here. Sure. I, uh, you know, I find like it would take me like to do one page to pencil it, go scan it, ink it, and then take it back into Photoshop and do it. I, it was taking like a week to do like a page, really? which I'm sure like, you know, guys like Nick Bradshaw, it's like, well, that's probably normal. Like, because there was just so detailed. I'm like, yeah, the line's not that detailed and it looks bad. <laughs> but you know, like I, I actually decided like this comic I'm putting out, like I decided before we moved, I'm like, oh, I, I want to go back and like redraw a bunch of pages. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that's even showing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I saw that on your social media as well, I think earlier. Yeah. And it's like, I just decided I'm like, I have some time. I'm cutting it close. I was like, but I have to go back and like redraw a bunch of pages from like two years ago because mm-hmm. it's like it just doesn't the style from then just doesn't match up now and it's like oh people are going to notice <laughs> that that artistic the inner uh, critic and all us artists were oh yeah you know, i'm just needling at myself I'm like uh, do i keep going or do i go back it's like well, i went <laughs> back <laughs> oh but yeah it's uh it's it's taking off now in a way you know when i got back when i was out when i was at west you know, I tried connecting with other artists, with different people out there. I just, maybe it was just where I was looking, but I just, I couldn't find that kind of community. Like I, I was used to back here, mm-hmm. you know, I well, got back. So what did you go West for? Um, uh, work. Yeah. Okay. So what do you, what did you do? So I, I'm a graphic designer. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. Welcome to the, uh, welcome yeah. to the party. Yeah. Yeah, I. Uh, it seems I to be a natural progression for people that want to do comics and art because it's oh, yeah. it gives you the skills to do that on top oh, yeah. of you know actually making a viable living. Hopefully. Oh yeah, it's you know what I've come to learn about the print and publishing side of things just from being a designer, like mm-hmm. running print shops and stuff over the years. Like, it's just 
it's given me such valuable information and like, you know, some kind of tricks and, you know, little shortcuts around things. And it's, uh, it's what can be going up there for a long time. You know, I, I was just designing stuff for these different companies. I was right now I work for a company. We, uh, uh in Red Deer and we, uh, we supply, we're the, one of the largest suppliers of like industrial workwear. So I do all their marketing. i make video commercials for them, uh, catalogs, everything. If it, mm-hmm. if it needs to be made, I guess I, I kind of make it. No, <laughs> it's, very cool. it's just me. So <laughs> Interesting. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's given me a lot of freedom. And thankfully, I've actually been able to take that job with me back to Halifax. Oh, so, fantastic. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you to do that remotely. So that's, that's great. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Well, like doing a marketing for a company, just being a marketing guy would be interesting because I work at a sign shop. So, you know, I'm just always doing different, like uh, various signs, business card designs, like vehicle. Design. Like it keeps you busy enough, but in, with different stuff. But oh, trying yeah. to like manage the whole brand on your own would be interesting. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. You know, it's, you know, you get to see, you get to kind of grow with this kind of company. Like mm-hmm. it's a family business. You know, we, uh, I've been with them for about a year now. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's just, it's never a dull moment. Every, every project is just so fun. And it's, you know, the, the time I have, like, and thankfully because we have such a big time difference, you know, I get up in the morning and before anyone's at the office, I have drawn like a page or two of my comic. So <laughs> I can just do whatever. I can go play Skyrim or, you know, mm-hmm. do some Spanish. <laughs> Are you learning Spanish? Well, I used to. I got to jump back into it. My, my girlfriend's Spanish. So, oh, yeah. So That's I'm trying it. to pick it back up. I, I was able to speak some of it like like a like a five year old level. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, even that's impressive. Um, <laughs> I speak very little French, especially the name like Andre Mayette. But uh, <laughs> But uh, it's like my, my wife speaks it very fluently because she works for um, uh, Agripure, which is um, Scott, Scottsburn. It's like the milk ice cream oh, place. Yeah. But they're, they're owned by a, their Montreal company now. So she, uh, oh. you know, started doing the class and stuff to, to really, to really uh, get it good. And she's fantastic at it. She can do her presentation and stuff in French and do everything. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's like Danielle. She's, uh, she's technically, she's trilingual, but like officially, I think. But mm-hmm. she, like, she can speak her mother tongue Spanish, then it's English and French, and she can speak conversational German. So I'm like, you're coming with me anywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because I'm gonna get in trouble somewhere. Of course, yeah. when we were going through Quebec, she would never not talk to anyone. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I sound if I try to speak French to go to Montreal. I'm sure that you know, I I think they appreciate that you're trying. Yeah, um, you know, like to order in a restaurant or something. I'll try, you know, or I, I can I can muddle through enough that they can probably figure out what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah. Um, but I do like trying. So I'm, I would like to maybe do Duolingo or one of those things. And, you know. Oh, yeah, they're pretty. That's pretty handy. It. Uh, yeah, she just got me a textbook with like CDs and stuff and like just little lessons. So but it's it's been handy. <laughs> I just got to get back into it because all I can ask for is help fire and diarrhea and that's all i can say <laughs> well, those are important things to be able to get out there it's like well if i'm going down south and i'm you know i'm having spicy food and, and alcohol it's like i'm going to be saying that i'm wearing those words out <laughs> just <laughs> all over the resort but uh yeah it's uh it's weird being back you know uh i have all these i i guess like saint john's got a convention now fog city comic-con and you know i i don't even th- i don't even know if dartmouth comic what was it? Dartmouth Comic, Comic Art Festival? Festival. Yeah, I'm not even sure if that was a thing when I was still living here. Maybe, maybe not. I want to say it's been around seven or eight years now. Maybe more than oh, that. Maybe. I think COVID screwed up how much time I remember things being around because things were canceled for so long. Yeah, it's it's weird. You know, I got to start making the rounds, and thankfully, being in Halifax, I mean, there's Halcon, so I'm like, oh, thank God. Did you get in this year? <laughs> I didn't even bother put my name in this year just because I. The last couple of years, I never got in when I tried, so I just kind of didn't feel like I'd have as much of a shot. Maybe I should have anyway, just to get a shot. I I don't think I'm going to go for it this year. I'll probably just like go to buy stuff. Like last time yeah. I went, I just went to buy stuff. I got this like like 18 inch Galactus figure for like nice. 10 bucks. I was like, snatch. <laughs> Man, that's a great find. Oh, that was one of the best ones I've ever found. Like, but unfortunately, I have no shelf. Like at the right height he's always kind of yeah, crunched over the ceiling i know it's the worst <laughs> some of the big ones like those life-size gremlins are just so big that they 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 you only have to set them on a shelf somewhere and 
hope for the best. In a stroller. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> just, just push them around like a baby. Yeah. It uh it's funny that yeah, it's uh I like to go to them. I like to I want to start hustling more, you know. Yeah, like, we'll uh, talk to Cal and have you talked to Strange Adventures and those guys? Like because uh, Cal, Cal's super welcoming of anybody that's selling their own books. He'll he'll probably buy a stack off you and sell them in the store or or figure out some consignment thing. I, I I've only met him once. I, I've been to Strange Adventures like a thousand times, not in Halifax, but the one in Fredericton. Oh yeah. And I remember once the original one, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> This is, uh, you know, the those early days of comics and, you know, for, for me and my friends. And, you know, I remember I went up to him. Mitchell couldn't come. And I was like, okay, I'm going to take my co- our comic up to him and pitch it to him. This is such a, it was like, oh, we're pitching to Stan Lee. This is going to be incredible. And, but we, we hadn't really considered anything to do with business. It was just like, oh, he's going to like the comic and that's enough. It's like, <laughs> it didn't matter that each comic costs about 25 bucks to print. <laughs> <laughs> And it's the first thing he asks. He's like, you know, so oh, he's like, it's cool, but like, you know, what did you pay for? Like, oh, like, you know, twenty four ninety five. He's like, he's like, no. He's like, of course yeah, I'm not. not. Going to sell this for fifty bucks and make your profit or whatever. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, I was like, I, I just he handed it back, and I was just like, my whole world just collapsed. I was like, <laughs> what is this? I was like, I'll never make it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh god Cal's such an interesting character because he's such a friendly guy but then sometimes we catch him on the wrong like you know and if he's just like had enough of you know people or generally sometimes <laughs> he seems a little prickly if you don't know him but like at his heart of hearts he's a great guy all, all the way around and yeah. uh, it's just so funny but it, it, he's brutally honest <laughs> which is, is important I guess Oh, and I, you know, I at the time, like I, I totally understood where he came from too. And I, yeah, just, well, I mean, it's, yeah. there's, I mean, as a business person, you can't sell that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it sucks uh, to tell that to a kid, but you, you got to <laughs> learn somehow. I he just, and he's like, sorry, man. He's like, if you can print it, like, you know, he's like, print, try printing it like black and white; it'll be cheaper, you know. And try this or that, and I was like, oh, I guess so. I was like, oh, you know, going gonna... to compromise my artistic vision. You mean his <laughs> <and> color. <laughs> Oh, you know what is blood? <laughs> yes. oh. Why don't you just oh. cut my throat right now, Cal? Let me <laughs> bleed out on the floor right here. <laughs> Take each page and just slice across my throat. <laughs> That's what you're doing to me right now. <laughs> you're killing me, Cal. Just screaming at him. It's, uh, it's it's funny that you know it. Uh, and that's the other side of this whole, like you know, the whole indie comic scene, especially like I'm sure it's the same everywhere, but like in the Maritimes, because like that's you know where i'm at as as an artist as a writer i want and given like the last 10 years working as a designer and working in marketing i'm like you know the skills i had when i got into this 10 years ago you know what i can offer jim paul you know like i just did a commercial for jim for his comic and i was like guys like you know i can now i make commercials and stuff and i was like i can now make this stuff for you like mm-hmm. you know a lot of the time, like I remember when I first got into it with Paul, we were talking about a story and this Western one, the gun. I was like, you know, I, I've never, I'm not, I've never negotiated money and artwork and stuff. I don't know how that works. I was like, oh God, what is this? Is this the wrong thing to say? How do I approach it? And I think I just boiled it down. I'm like, so do we get money for this? <laughs> and he was like, no, it's purely exposure. He's like, whatever money's made. I, I think he was saying, I was like, it goes back to like running the website. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, you know, it's it's exposure, and it, and then I came to discover a lot of guys. That's all they do it for is exposure. So I'm like, well, that's fine, that's cool. I, I you know, and I, I do it for fun too. You know, it doesn't have, it's not going to pay the bills, you know, but it's it's fun. But I, I always, I always kind of, you know, just rub me the wrong way. I was like, you know, everybody's busting their ass here, know. you know, for for years. You know, some of these projects, you know, like Jim's been, Jim hustles comics that he's been working on for like you know 20 years and i'm like man like you you know this is good work like you should you should really try and shoot for the stars here and i i i was trying and trying and trying to get him a you know i was like you should try and go through amazon Mm -hmm. Ah, i don't know about that i was like go through amazon because amazon owns kindle now yep so you can sell hard copies you can do ebooks i was like and they just take their cut yeah and you take the profit and they print them on demand too so you don't even need like a bunch of them like yeah yeah like if you want some for conventions i think they give you like it's actually like as much as you hate to be like amazon give them more money um it's still as a creator it's a very viable way to get your stuff out there oh yeah it's It's, easy too right i mean if you somebody you know in alberta wants to order one and they have prime or something 
you know, they can get one and just, you know, it's no issue. You don't get a mail to them. You don't get to figure all that out. Oh, it's, it's incredible. And like, I was, you know, like I'm no Amazon fan, but I'm like, as a creator, it's like, I can't turn that up. Like, that's really good. Yeah, like, yeah. I, uh, like my girlfriend's mom, she's a middle school teacher down in Florida and she has, uh, she had three classes of like, Oh, we want to talk to a comic creator and someone that works in publishing. I'm like, Oh, okay, let's do this. And, you know, great kids. And we were chatting and stuff. I was so nervous, but you know, they had a great energy and we're interested in learning about this stuff. And I just keep pressing some, like, you know, if you're going to do it, like, you know, get into like, do it as cheap as possible. And like Amazon allows you to do it. I should have been getting a discount from Amazon for like <laughs> advertising for them. <laughs> but they, uh, you know, even for those kids, you know, I, I was able to order author copies and it was like, just, I was just paying costs. I wasn't even paying like, you know, anything more. It was like, Oh, it's going to, it just pay us like five bucks per comic. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, wow, like this, this isn't bad. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, this, this is pretty good. <laughs> I've been thinking about like, I, I kind of think my days of doing single issues and trying to like make it into a thing are kind of done. It's been a long time since I've done anything, but I'm getting pretty antsy about it. So uh, I think the, the graphic novel done in one story is the way I want to do it. Mm. So um, oh, I have yeah. some ideas. I think I'm going to, pull the trigger on it sooner than later but i just want to uh i've been looking at some stuff and yeah i think that might be a good way to go as much as i just as not as distasteful as it feels i do use amazon quite a bit for other stuff yeah. so uh, it's like yeah. well you know I, I hate to give bezos more money so you can go back to space again but it's like <laughs> you know it's it's hard it's a weird thing you walk in in the creator world to try to you know make money not spend too much money on the things you're trying to make money keep your costs down but also you know, tread like, I guess, a moral line, whatever you think is, you know, the best way to do things. Yeah. It's, you, you got to balance a lot and, you know, where, where you want to stand and where you want to support. And, you know, like I, I was pitching some, I don't know if yeah, you saw it there. I made a group on Facebook called launch title, launch title comics group. Did I see this? Maybe, All right. maybe, maybe. I know a few guys that they've been like crazy posting to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the original post, uh, I was trying to like tell people, I was like, Hey, like we're all like, we're all great artists and comic creators. Like, why don't we like create like a collective where, you know, <laughs> you know, put something kind of formal together. So a few of them were like, yeah, let's do it. And then like, we haven't talked about it since I basically moved, mm-hmm. but it's like, I want to sit down with some, like, you know, you, Jim, Paul, like all these other guys, like, and just dive into something. I've had a dream for a while and I I had to do the math on it, but I I think I could figure it out if I had the time to do it, to just be like, like the Maritime comics book of ghosts and then say, get Mm. creators together and say, do a, you know, a 10 page story or, you know, whatever, and get like, you know, however many people I can get together to do it. And then, you know, figure out whatever costs, split it between everybody, get enough books that everybody can get, you know, a split. I mean, with Amazon, maybe just do it that way. But so that everybody can get a good number to sell themselves, you know, and just do it that way. I think that'd be really like, I don't want to, like, I'd organize it, but I don't want to like, it's not some big money making thing. It's just a way for all of us to do a book that, you know, those compilation books are cool. Like I had a story in the, the whole of the shocking one that Cal put out a few years ago, Uh, geez, a long time ago now, but so, you know, like then that was really fun and a cool little project. So like, if you can just do that. With local people there's enough local creators that are like yourself and myself and other people like dave howlett and other people i know that have had in the show even even guys that write for marvel and stuff i doubt they would want to do that because obviously you know they have bigger fish to fry but you know there's a lot of them around here so it, it seems like there's a cool well of people that uh, that you could do some fun stuff with oh yeah the, the 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 talent in the community on the east coast is it's just it's thick you can mm-hmm. cut it with a knife you know yeah. <laughs> Or the comic pages. Yeah. <laughs> They're cutting my throat. <laughs> well, uh, well, tell me about the new book. So what, what is this? Uh, yeah, this has been, this is a, a sci-fi story I've been working on for a number of years. Like, con- like hardcore working on it. Like, okay, like I'm going to make a public, like an actual effort to publish it, this piece. Mm-hmm. Probably the last year and a half, like actually devoting time to it. I, and I, I've taken... I started it back in 2017 and I got a few pages in. I actually put it together originally as a proposal for Dark Horse mm-hmm. and Image. Dark Horse, uh, I never heard, never heard back from, but I also kind of think 
aside from the fact that it probably wasn't up the rally anyways, I also may have filled up the application wrong <laughs> and was just, and it's like, well, what's the point in like resending? Cause like, <laughs> it's like that guy who says a joke at a party and nobody laughs. He says it again. They're like, well, we heard you the first time. <laughs> I was like, I, I think I'll save face and not contact them. <laughs> And then image got back to me and they're like, you know, it's, you know, it's just not uh, really something of our catalog. It's not of our caliber. I was like, okay, you know, that's all right. That's fair. At least you tried. Yeah. And, you know, for me anyways, like they were the two biggest options because I wanted to retain complete uh, creative control. I really just wanted their help for marketing purposes, for their sales connections, that kind of thing, just distribution. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that stuff. And then, shortly after I discovered Amazon and uh, I have their shirt on Amazon under my, this <laughs> button. <Yeah. laughs> Jeff, I just out of frame is Jeff Bezos, like watching, like just go, mm, yeah. it's like making yeah. sure that you stick to the script. It's a, it's a tablet with him. He's streaming too. And he's, yeah. my chest. <laughs> he's in Very space. <laughs> We're going to send you more uh, flesh eating bugs. That's right. Excellent. <laughs> and <laughs> Full circle. I like it. <laughs> so he, it, uh, you know, it's, it started off a long time ago and it's just, you know, it comes from a love of old, you know, nostalgia uh, for old movies, you know, Jurassic Park, obviously, but mm -hmm. even largely like Terminator. Uh, Terminator is a massive influence for it. Back to the Future. I, I just love anything to do with time travel. I was going to say, it sounds like time travel. Yeah. <laughs> I love time travel. I love dinosaurs. I'm like, well, let's mess something up, you know, and originally, um, when I first started working on this back in 2017, putting this proposal together, I, I had gotten to a point where I did six pages uh, for the proposal. And then I was like, you know, well, in case they come back and they want to see more, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. So I did an additional like four or five pages. So I had like about 10 or 12 in total. And it was going to be basically uh, the lead was a character. He was this, you know, uh, very very much an amalgamation really of uh, what's his name? Owen Grady, Chris Pratt's character from Jurassic world and Sam Neill's character. He was, you know, he was a local cop, but he was, you know, your typical eighties, nineties kind of action hero kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, like I was actually in the throes in red deer. Uh, it was, it was quite a culture shock up there. I was starting to see things that were really influencing my writing because I was writing a fantasy novel at the same time. Um, I was seeing a lot of uh, racial discrimination. Like it was, it, it's rife out west. Uh, it's yeah, great. I don't want to speak ill <laughs> of my fellow yeah. countrymen or different parts. But <laughs> so, somebody I can't remember who it was, but a friend of mine recently said that uh, Alberta was the uh, the Florida of Canada, which for some yeah. reason struck a chord with me. Um, that I was <laughs> like, because like. I get everybody has issues with what their interest, like what the, their support for politicians or for the public or their decisions. Mm -hmm. And everybody has, if you have a dog in the fight, obviously regarding oil and pipelines, you're going to fight harder for that. Um, and oil, like Canada has a real problematic relationship with oil um, and a lot of other things besides that. But, you know, I feel like it's so like Canada doesn't really have Republicans, but we kind of do when they live in Alberta and I'm not saying it's all of them. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to alienate any, my, my, anybody that listens to the show in Alberta, but, Oh yeah, of course. But there, I feel like if you're listening, if you're, I, there's a weird lie. Like it feels like if you're artsy or you're into comics, you're into books, like you're really, and you really analyze it in an, in an artistic way. Like you really appreciate the art of it instead of just going to watch a movie to kill time. Um, that I feel like that most, statistically most of those people are generally pretty left-leaning and not that you have to put a label on everything but you know are fairly uh, empathetic and, and can understand other sides of the uh, the opinion or the issue um, oh, yeah. and not make snap judgments or, or deal with things like racism and those sort of things i feel like it opens your mind to a lot of things like i think art's a gateway to open your mind to a lot of things that you know oh yeah you watch movies about people's struggles in other countries and you might have a little more um sympathy for those people than to just write them off as being a drain on the system um or you're you know which i always find funny people complain about the refugees issues because it's like <laughs> you think that if the government save money anyway they're going to spend it on you like they'll yeah. find something else <laughs> that's a good way to put it actually yeah yeah do you think it's all coming back in your bank account you're like oh thank god we didn't take any of those refugees from ukraine here's an extra thousand dollars the government sent me this year like it's not gonna happen like it's it's stupid 
it's yeah it's it, it was and yeah and it's not you know i i think moving to alberta was the best decision for my career as a designer and yeah, you know for sure 100 i mean the opportunities are massive there it's you know I, I can't, it's, it's not for me as, you know, I just don't like country music and I don't like the, <laughs> the weather too is just really extreme. Like, yeah. you know, you get the, it's beautifully hot. It's like 36 degrees Celsius and mm-hmm. it's dry, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, a month or two into summer, the rest of the summer until it snows is just smoky because of the fires, unfortunately. And then, you know, it's just, it's very hard <laughs> and yeah. my sinuses can't handle it. <laughs> I feel like being that far from the ocean would be would bother me. I like I like yeah. like I'm not like a massive need to be in the ocean all the time guy, but the idea that I can go and stick my feet in the ocean, I just like that. Yeah, I, I live in Truro, so I'm not like you know a beach is about half an hour, forty five minutes away, so it's not too bad. But uh, and I mean Halifax has places too, but it's just I feel like the idea that I you know I guess you swim in a lake, do you or a pool? I uh, mean pool, obviously, but it's funny. I used to go magnet fishing. Uh, oh yeah. It, have you heard heard of magnet like these guys over in england they have a it's like a hockey puck sized earth magnet on a piece of rope mm-hmm. just throw it into a lake or river see what, see what you, find. you can find that's a good i i like that uh, i like that better than fishing i would yeah. probably be down for that so it's funny i you know and that's what i would do to get out of the house you know i would go to the red deer river and you know one year the water had just gone down so like we had like a drought Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, like there was like five shopping carts that had risen to the top. <laughs> <laughs> a and, body uh, floating in between. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it there's there was lots, you know, keep you busy outside and stuff. It's uh it's just it's a very the things I was seeing there mm-hmm. socially, uh, and there were certainly things that were making headlines nationally, you know. Yeah. Um, literally outside of our apartment, like if I came up the front door and turned right, there was um a very violent protest. Um, there was cops getting knocked over. There was people getting shoved, punched, that kind of thing. Jesus. Um, and there, it was just like, it was very shocking. And there was, I had friends too, who were being victimized by, by the police at one point. Um, a buddy of mine, him and his roommates, they got robbed at gunpoint, like in their house. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and my buddy who was the only black roommate there when the cops showed up they put him in cuffs and it took all his roommates like harassing the cops like hey like let him go let him go like he didn't do anything before they would actually like listen and like stop oh dear god you know and it's it was just different things like that like it just it was it became something that i was very aware of and where my my girlfriend is uh latina i and growing up with friends that are latin as well i've i've always had kind of a an exposure to to that kind of side of the tracks, I guess mm-hmm. you could say, you know, so as I was writing this comic and drawing it out, I got thinking, I'm like, you know, like there were things we were, we were faced with like these social dilemmas. And I decided, you know, uh, you know, whether people like it or not, like, it, you know, I don't, I don't know who's going to read my comic. Hopefully people do, but I'm going to change it. I'm going to change all of it. I, I was at a point in which I had to change things anyways, because I had gotten so far in the comic. It was at the page that you're about to see the dinosaurs get revealed for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I didn't actually know what they were going to look like. <laughs> I didn't even actually pick the dinosaurs. I just knew I wanted dinosaurs. So I was like, let's stop here and so, let's go back. <laughs> oh, so what did you, what did you wind up with? Like, what was the, so what's the core, uh, like time travels involved, but where do we get to, yeah, I guess your elevator pitch, not to, not to spoil the book, but just. Oh the, yeah. Oh yeah. It's, you know, so I went back to the drawing board because originally it was just going to be dinosaurs that were clones modern day clones that were going to like kidnap the president and hold them hostage so that they could uh you know fire off nukes and take over the world it was just really strange and cerebral Mm -hmm. so i went back to the drawing board i read it all of it and what it is now is it's a story that follows a local sheriff whose dad worked for an r&d corporation in nevada and she is latin and i'm trying to really uh press this emphasis and this representation um across not just her character but also the dinosaurs yeah because the dinosaurs are products they are genetically engineered dinosaurs they're cyborgs they're bred for war and they're used by this corporation mockingbird mockingbird r&d and they are used you know they're sold off to different countries for war mm-hmm. and it, it goes right into the future so the dinosaurs who are mistreated and stuff all these different kind of extinct uh, creatures that are being bred for war 
this band of them get together and say, to hell with this, let's go back to like, you know, prehistoric time. There's no people. We can just get the hell out of here. You know, it's like their last ditch effort. And they're just being dogged basically across time and space because they end up crash landing um, in modern day Nevada. So they actually are still within a time period where they can still be attacked by their captors. Mm -hmm. And then the sheriff, she has to work with them to kind of unravel this mystery of what really happened to her dad. Because her dad worked for this corporation and helped uh, breed the dinosaurs. So the whole, yeah, it's, it, what's the title? Jurassic warp. Yeah. Jurassic Warp. It's, you know, it's been a, a, a passion project for me, you know, many, many, many nights rewatching the trilogy of the dead <laughs> <laughs> over and over. Just so well, you, didn't, really... you didn't go further into the other ones. You, you were or <laughs> diary of the dead or land of the dead. Uh, I've tried no, a couple. I've it's tried all right. a couple. I, th- I think you got the right ones there. Yeah. <laughs> I, and you know, the thing is, it's funny. Cause like, I can't, when I'm drawing or writing, I can't, I have to have something on the background to just to kind of like keep me like engaged and like fuel. And that just kind of helps me keep up for the night. Mm-hmm. Cause like I'll be up to like four in the morning and I can't do it. If it's a movie I haven't seen before. Cause I'll be drawn like, Oh wow. What's that? What's he doing? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm, yeah. so I'll just constantly rewatch the same like horror movies. Or I like, I have all my uh, carpenter movies on a Google drive. I just keep <laughs> reopening, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, the whole for me, the story really, the dinosaurs represent, uh, what's the best way to say it? A lot of my friends come from immigrant families. They fled, you know, uh, from Guatemala. Mm-hmm. Um, they fled from pretty, pretty dire circumstances. And they came here with, you know, the clothes on their back. They came here with very little uh, to go on. And they've made like amazing lives for themselves. And to be able to grow up with these people, and be welcome in their home and considered a part of the family. And you get to hear these stories of, you know, trial and tribulation on their way here, you know, um, making it out with their lives, you know, and that's all they had. You know, I have, I have friends who they're, you know, one of my friends, his dad, like the guy, he, he worked uh, in the military fighting the, these gorillas and the gorillas had shown up to his house to kill him. And he just happened not to be there at the time he was out. And when he came home, his, family told him like you have to leave so he had to leave like his his wife at the time his daughter like everyone kind of split up and what you know, country is this, is this guatemala this is guatemala oh wow jesus you know people split up for you know years and years and you know people have gone back and stuff and you know once it got settled but yeah i can't remember who said it but they once said that you cannot like the cure for racism is travel like go around the world and see and then you'll you know uh th- what drives me nuts and i i have I guess friends and quotes, I'll use the word associates, people I know that have some, you know, <laughs> fairly right wing ideas about like, you know, immigrants and this sort of thing. And it's like, they're like, well, they're not real immigrants. You know, that that's not really a this. That's not really that. And it's like, if you boil it down to what it is, it's people wanting to be safer for their kids. And yeah. like, how can you argue with that? Regardless of whether it ticks the official boxes of refugee status or whatever, like it's people that want a better life for their kids. Like how, how can you as a human being an empathetic human being not understand that it's like, it it's drives me insane it's it's like people do all these weird mental gymnastics to make things fit this narrative that makes them feel better about stuff and oh. it, uh, it, it it's insane it's it is you know it's it's you know i know over covid like i and you know coming into the ukraine kind of uh crisis mm. you know i've had people like i Again, associates. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I don't really need you around. Yeah, me. I don't really interact you know, with people so much anymore. It's Sometimes like you have know, to work wise, but it's like I don't. I don't. Yeah, work. it's 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 a shame, you know. And I just like when I was doing this whole talk with these kids, you know, I included a, a kind of letter from the editor, so to speak, you mm-hmm. know, where you know I try and explain, you know, I I I'm very humbled by these kind of stories. It's mm-hmm. very. You know, you, you, you can recognize the privilege we have here. You know, no one's going to come to my house to try and kill me. No one's going to try, you know, yeah. if I try and start a union, no one's going to try and, you know, hurt mm-hmm. me or harm my family. You know, I, I'll probably just get fired. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a union of one, I guess, in my yeah, that's right. <laughs> solidarity. But it's, yeah, you know, brother, <laughs> <laughs> you know, with this, with this right story, on, comrade. It, yeah, it's, uh, 
yeah, I'll be, I'll get fired quick if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, for me, it's taking something that's so serious. So it's, it's a reality for so many people and not trying. I've always been trying to treat it very carefully with kid gloves, but respectfully, mm-hmm. you know, I, like I let my buddy Mitchell read the comic, uh, just the first like 30 pages I had at the time. And he's like, you know, you can take something like, that's kind of silly it's just dinosaurs and time travel and like you can you know it, what you can play thematically with it is it's interesting mm-hmm. you know i think well to use time travel as uh, i don't think it's probably original 100 percent to use time travel as a, a but you know to, to deal with the immigrant issue or or anything like that but um i mean i think south park kind of did it too but uh but there but that idea is is great like you can really flesh out like you look at movies like district nine and stuff which are like you know it's aliens trapped on earth but it's a it's a refugee thing it's they're treated shittily you know they're put in camps and they're not given a status like regular people and that like you know they just fill in for the way you know we treat refugees or immigrants or in our own society and uh i love like science fiction is so great for that because you can make a story as deeply political but you know not saying hide it like you have to hide it yeah, but it makes it more accessible to people, and hopefully, those paying attention may learn something and, and might shift their idea. I hope so. Yeah, it's you know, it's something I hope to make this into a trilogy because where I decided to go back and redo that first kind of bundle of pages, mm-hmm. I basically sacrificed the, the ending of the book, so I'm kind of cutting it off at a certain point. Mm-hmm. So it'll be like you know, the first hundred pages, the next part will be the next hundred pages after that, and the, however, I'm going to end it. But it's, you know, it's, it is, I think for me, as a creator, it's important to include some kind of uh, greater message. There has to be, there just, I don't know, I just, I feel like writing without some kind of purpose like that, like delivering some kind of message of. Uh, I think that's the difference between fluff and real art is, is that there's something behind it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> no. it's, you know, I don't know if it'll come off well. I, I hope so. I, <laughs> I well. certainly hope so. Well, I mean, did, otherwise, you, I spent a year on nothing. But <laughs> well, you, you just sold another issue, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, it uh, should be here by Friday. <laughs> so uh, you're working on part two now? Is that what issue two? Yeah, I. So I'm wrapping. Well, I'm going to wrap this one up. Mm-hmm. Um, I have the story for the second one coming, hopefully, in the next couple months. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. This this graphic novel. I'm hoping. I should have it ready for publication. It'll I'm hoping to actually drop it on June 1st mm-hmm. on Amazon and Kindle. And it's only going to be available through, cause I don't really have a Facebook page anymore. I'm just mm-hmm. like, I can't as much as I can draw away from Facebook. I would prefer it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, uh, only for work. So I'm only going to be selling it through my Instagram page okay. um, and just like putting commercials out there and whatnot and just sharing it word of mouth. But you know, it's, uh, yeah, and I'm I'm probably gonna take a break between this this story and the next one, just where I do have fantasy novels I'm working on at the time. So, and that's been something I've been working on for like seven years now. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do something. <laughs> I gotta put yeah, one of these out. I understand that impulse. It's like someone's <laughs> gotta, I gotta do something. Here. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's it's a these are passion projects, and I hope, yeah. I hope it you know, anyone who reads it you know enjoys it, but I hope even on a bigger scale that they uh they take something bigger away from the the story and the themes hopefully it's a, a learning experience yeah it'd be nice well, fantastic. i mean they are dinosaurs but <laughs> yeah but still like i said I, I i feel like there's a real heart there's a real message and a real heart behind that sort of material and uh and you can tell when someone feels passionately about something and has an issue to to get across so yeah. uh, i'm happy that people like you are out there you know banging the drum and getting that stuff out there thanks man <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh cool well and anything i missed in both the, the don watson story the don watson saga <laughs> <laughs> uh, part, part one yeah well i you know i think uh going forward after this comic you know i really want to get you know different creators like yourself jim everybody like you know i i want to collaborate with you guys more and i think you know the the community we have like it's something it's funny. I was actually listening to a podcast and it made me think, you know, uh, Ricky Gervais is talking. I, do you ever listen to Ricky Gervais show? Uh, I didn't even know he had a podcast. So no, but I would like it's, to, I love him. I think he's great. So 
it's like i think his podcast is like 17 16 years old it's quite old now but it's at the time it was like the number one podcast in the world and it's so funny it's amazing oh man but, totally do oh yeah it's i think the whole thing's on youtube as well like uh, i'm pretty sure it is but he he says something to his buddy carl and he says you know when it comes to art like art isn't it's not it's never safe mm. it's only safe in numbers and it's like i that's always kind of stuck with me and I think, you know, of these older, you know, there's older guys, you know, Jim, I'm not insulting Jim. He is older than me. I mean, it's a fact. <laughs> uh, I don't think he would be insulted. <laughs> he, he is literally older than me. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> the, the facts are, are in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, physically uh, older. The polls do not lie. <laughs> That's true, yeah. You know, and it's like, there's such a community here. Like when you hear these older kind of veteran creators talk about, you know, uh, the comic stores of yesteryear in St. John or, you know, uh, Moncton or whatever. I'm like, it just, it's such a community that I, th- I think it needs protecting. It needs to be bolstered and it needs support. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the things we can do with our stories and our craft are, it's amazing. You know, uh, like see, going, I remember going to HarperCon for that first time, like seeing your stuff there. That was awesome. Seeing Jim's stuff. That was incredible. Nick, I want my USB back, you know, but yes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it was just amazing. Second year of HarborCon was a wash. <laughs> that was I terrible. didn't even know they had a second year. I think I thought the first one was it. I didn't realize there's another one. It was terrible. Oh. Uh, <laughs> we were stuck in a basement of St. John High. Oh, maybe that's why I didn't go. <laughs> and no one knew where we were. We had friends trying to find us and all they had for a sign to like tell people that there was people in the basement was a piece of paper and the paper had fallen <laughs> off the wall <laughs> no one knew like we were a hand there. drawn sharp it looks like a horror movie just like like written all, <laughs> all scarily wow. like on the sheet just wilson blood hand people <laughs> people in basements you know like just written on the, yeah, right with the handprint oh it oh was, dear god <laughs> well like we, we thought it was going to be in the gym like yeah. logically we were like oh it's going to be in the gym like that's why they're going there no, it wasn't at all. They use they didn't even use the gym, I think, or they use it for like t- doing photo shoots for like cosplay. I'm like, well, that must be like that must take up like eight square feet. Like, can we all <laughs> can we go and sit in there? And no, there was people fighting over tables. There was no order. It was like Lord of the Flies. It was just chaos. <laughs> it was like a con chaos. shell. You're beating another kid over the head with a, with a rock. <laughs> I need that power bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it, well, uh, yeah. Well, no, man, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to hear you say stuff like that. Cause I, I've been kind of saying stuff similar to it for years. So I think it's oh, might be yeah. time to get it going and just do it. Right. And you're right. It's oh. no time like now. And, and I think there's enough really talented, creative people out there locally that could contribute to something really special. So I think so. Well, I let's think do so. it. Let's talk. And now that you're in Halifax, I'm only in Toronto and I'm in Halifax. Yeah. Very often, so, Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I'll have a man cave here. We can all meet in. <laughs> the... I was going to say next time in the city, we grab a beer or something together. That'd be fun. Oh yeah, man. I'd love to. And, and thanks again for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. I was, I was thanks so for reaching for out. No, dude, I, I was so happy. Like I'm always asking people to like suggest guests or like, you know, give me feedback or something. So, um, you know, hopefully this instills other people to reach out. Cause I, anybody that's just doing their own thing, I'd, I'd love to talk to them about it. Cause that's, that's part of the joy of this for me. So. Oh, I, I really appreciate it. And I, it's funny because like I uh, when I found out you were doing this, I was like, I was like, son of a bitch. I was like, I want to do something like this too. I was like, this is like this is so cool. Like, you know, getting I I saw the like the dolls. And I'm like, oh, I need those. <laughs> I was yeah, like, I don't no. know. I don't know when it's coming, but I'm super excited for whenever it gets here. <laughs> Uh, some of those <laughs> yeah she's done some amazing she was like plus she's super into horror so i knew we'd have a great conversation about that but uh um and you are too which is awesome oh but, yeah uh, speaking of time travel uh one one movie have you ever seen time crimes time crimes it's by I nacho think. i can never pronounce his name right nacho vitalu or he did that movie um with anne hathaway uh colossal oh okay Oh, she was, oh, yeah, the one with yeah. her and uh, Jay Sudeikis where she would like walk into space in a park and then a monster would appear in Japan and kind of do what she does. It was like a puppety thing. Kind of, yeah. yeah. And then uh, it was Sudeikis was terrifying as a, as a bad guy in that movie. He did a really good job. Yeah. So was uh, it was, but his he's Spanish, like originally, I, I'm Mexico, I'm guessing. But um, 
he uh his first mo- one of his early movies is a spanish movie called time crimes and uh it's it's just it's very similar to i never saw it but what's that time movie time the one that like takes place on a garage or something that everybody always talks about it was like an indie movie that did really big oh. it's not it's not pie that's the aronofsky one there's some movie that's a time travel movie it mostly takes place in a garage that's the super low budget thing that was really popular but it's kind of a similar idea it's like a guy who has a sort of normal life that stumbles across like a lab and then gets involved in the time travel thing and then the oh. whole movie is kind of the same thing over with him running in a different version of himself that went back at different points and it gets really confusing uh but it's really good and um it's, it's that's the one that, uh, yeah. that that's that's the time travel one i couldn't think of yes uh, there's no e in it p-r-i-m-r right yeah yeah <laughs> That's the one, but the uh, this movie, just Time Crimes by him, is uh, I have the DVD for it. I don't think they ever put it on Blu-ray. Um, I grabbed it on a whim one time. I just saw it on a shelf when like a movie store was closing. But it's one I su- I would highly suggest. It's very good. I think okay. it's on Prime if you have Amazon Prime. I think it's on Prime Video. I had it for a while and then I got rid of it. And I now honestly I, oh my god, I just like it's funny we're talking about movies and just. I do you ever I use Tubi. I use Tubi oh, yeah. a lot. Like I have Crave. We're getting Disney Plus back now that we're landed here. Yeah, I, I have Disney Plus, Netflix, and Prime. Yeah, all the staples. And then Tubi, I just love it because it's all B and C list, like horror and action and sci-fi. And it's amazing. Some of the worst, like the best worst movies you'll ever see are on there. Like I'll give, uh, I'll give you another one here. Do you have Plex? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so plex is full of that stuff it's like <laughs> like i i got it just to use it as a server to put movies on it or stuff and then watch it on my tablet or my phone or on my playstation so my wife and i can watch shows that you know um i download you know oh, if I, someone's listening don't get mad um but <laughs> you know like i just started, started skimming through their live tv options and they have a channel that's just the trailers from hell trailers on a loop forever and i love that it's like i'm a huge joe dante fan so like watching that's awesome they have a channel that's just impact wrestling all the time but like oh, aside yeah. from that live stuff they got tons of movies on they're good horror movies yeah it's, I mean, i've been wanting to surprising. watch uh, Stuart gordon's dagon forever which is like an hp lovecraft adaptation oh, yeah. which most people say is one of the best ones and it's on there so like i'm definitely gonna go watch it yeah i i've been i've been falling into that trap like hardcore i i i was going back i watched uh what was it reanimator i love that movie yeah, reanimator really one and two are fantastic <laughs> the third one is like the third one is you know <laughs> if i were to rewatch it and my opinions may change the music video that came out with it is hilarious I, but, there's um, a music video <laughs> yeah it's called reanimate your is it re, reanimate your bones is that okay <laughs> or move your dead bones i think it's like move your dead bones 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 <laughs> the secret will keep you alive it's so stupid and it's like it's like like early 2000s would have when it came out and uh oh man it's such a weird movie chris hemsworth uh his wife is in that she's in, the uh in the third one schwarzenegger or anna ferris uh uh schwarzenegger oh really wait, oh wait is that her name or no oh, it's um she's spanish she's uh wait whose wife sorry uh, Chris Hemsworth, but Chris Pratt. Oh, Chris Hemsworth. Sorry, that's who I was thinking of. Chris, I got the mixed up. Yeah, I, I just discovered that the other day that Chris Pratt is ma- he's married to Schwarzenegger's daughter. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, what is this? But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, is what I, I thought was weird because like I'm watching the movie and like, like I'm, I'm like that's cool. Like it's all Spanish and stuff. I'm like, except for um, Jeffrey Combs. I'm like, he's the only non-Spanish guy in the film. I'm like. Huh. yeah it's a like, weird it's a weird movie um yeah she was the the the, the girl in it right um yeah that's that's funny um wow i did not know that yeah weird weird ass movie but Stuart gordon movies in general because he did like was it from beyond is really good um mm-hmm. i haven't i haven't seen the pit and the pendulum he did with lance hendrickson but i've heard good things about that as well he uh castle freak which i haven't watched yet but i've heard is really good he's done a lot of really cool movies like really oh uh, what's that one society have you ever seen that movie no i don't think so oh dude and that might be brian usna because like Stuart gordon and brian usna did reanimator and then i think they did one and two or maybe i think usna made a directed two and gordon directed one but then they kind of went their separate ways but usna did this movie called society which sort of posits the concept that the rich are almost are almost a different species than us and like it's yeah so and and there's this scene near the end where it's like this guy stumbles into like one of their parties 
um, and what happens. And uh, it's gross. It's one of the weirdest, grossest, strangest. <laughs> they, like, I don't want to give it away, but it's um, the, they call it the shunting. And that's all I'll say. You have to watch Ooh. it and see what that means. But it's a <laughs> it's a weird ass movie. I wouldn't say it's like the greatest movie ever, but the concept and the last 20 minutes alone are worth worth the time. So uh, definitely check it out. It's it's neat. It's kind of yeah, the sort of idea that the rich and the powerful aren't, aren't even the same species as the rest of us. <laughs> I like that. Um, That's a really cool concept. Yeah, it was. It's it's good. It, it, they did a really good job. And the, and the main character is like adopted, um, so he you know, but he's in a rich family, and he starts noticing strange things about their behavior once uh, he starts getting older. And it's uh, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Oh yeah, I you know what I really want to get is uh, Shutter. Oh, I have Shutter too. I, I got I got it through Prime. It's only like four bucks a month or four ninety nine if you have it through Prime Video. So, uh, yeah. So I mean, I have Prime anyway just for buying stuff from Amazon, but it comes with video, which is you know great. So uh, Shutter alone, I watch. Uh, I like the Joe Bob Briggs show. I watch that all the time because uh, oh, he has okay. the last drive-in where he'll do every Friday night. Although, if you have Arrow Video, if, sorry, if you have amazon if you have it as a channel through amazon you don't get the live tv options you can't just turn it on and watch when they stream stuff live um so i go to a friend's house to watch joe bob but they do the the um they do the repeats you can watch it that way but they'll watch it lives but it's so late it starts at 10 and they show two horror movies and he's in between giving you information and talking to people so you know it'll start at yeah it starts (laughs) at 10 and the first like i watched it last friday with a friend and you don't know what movies are going to be until it's on, right? So the first movie was Black Sunday, the uh, first Mario Baba movie. And uh, it was good. But like, by the time it's over, it's like 1230. And they're like, let's start movie two. And my friend's like, I don't know if I can do movie two. I'm like, that's fine. Like, I'll hit him. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah I know that feeling. <laughs> I, I love There's a lot of really good um, indie horror stuff uh, on it. Like, like if, if you like all things horror, you'll definitely enjoy mm. it. Oh yeah, I I I, I just live on horror. My friend BJ is a massive fan of it, and he turned me on to this movie called Scare Package, which I never seen. Yeah, it's I don't like it as much as he did. He loves it, um, but it's interesting. Like I feel like the concept deserved to be fleshed out more than it did. But you know they have a low budget, and it's you know an indie thing. But they have this this idea alone is enough for me. It's like this. I won't go into too much or spoil anything, but they end up going into this facility where the government has like a Jason Voorhees style killer that they captured and they're doing tests. Um, he's actually played by uh, Dustin Runnels, uh, Goldust from the WWE. Oh, really? But uh, yeah, he's like this guy who was like, <laughs> he had a, like a make a wish kid that was like, he was a big brother to or something. And that kid, he gave him a kidney and the kid survived and the kid went to university. But then the kid died in a hazing ritual in university. So he went and like, fucked up the fraternity and killed everybody and made a mask of their faces and like you know all this other stuff (laughs) so they have this guy and he's like in this facility and they're testing um they they have like a girl running on a treadmill in front of him and him running behind her and they have a thing saying how far away she's getting from him every time she hits a certain distance from him she falls she can't control it she'll just fall like oh. so it's like all those horror tropes like the government studying oh. what happens and they have a book that says like if he's within 14 meters of an american made car like 19 out of 20 <laughs> times it won't start you know like it just won't start it'll it'll you know and all these little oh, tropes cool. yeah so like that alone <laughs> is very interesting to me i kind of wish that was the whole movie like the fleshing like i mean it can only go so far but it was it was that stuff i thought was really clever you can have some fun with that so you know what's a really weird series is it just made me think of it is uh oh what the hell was I just watching it like a month ago uh oh the Hellraiser series oh, I've only seen the first one the first and second are really good it's very much like <laughs> diminishing returns I hear yeah it eventually it's... just became they would buy scripts for other horror movies and just fu- and just have writers put Pinhead in them yeah you know th- that's what? from like four on that's what they do yeah the the first and second are really really good I love it, the first one it's great. Yeah, the the effects are great. You know, the the quality overall is just through the roof. The third mm. one is where it starts to get a little bizarre, <laughs> but they actually like they actually flush out like an origin story. Yeah, and it goes back to like um, like I don't know, like seventeen hundreds, like France, and like you know, then it goes way into the future, like Jason X, and it's like 
<laughs> or you know I've heard it's that. like <laughs> what's happening here but after a while like it's such a weird series because it, it that's the thing there's just stuff happening but none of the core characters are in it even though they're on the poster like mm. i felt like i was getting like duped i was like you know <laughs> I, I mean i didn't pay for the film <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it's like hellraiser pinhead doesn't even show up until like the last like i swear to god one of the films he doesn't show up until the last 10 minutes yeah that's and what i like, mean they just <laughs> they just shoehorn him in in ways to make it a pinhead movie and try to get that they've made what like 20 of them i don't oh, know how many hellraiser god. movies there are but there's a lot um oh, too many <laughs> yeah but you know like interesting idea i think aren't they doing a new one i think they're rebooting it the the plan is there's a new one coming out in 2022 where it's a female pinhead this time it's kind yeah of yeah they're uh <laughs> Let's, let's, see where let's that try goes. that and see where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some concept art. I'm like, okay, I might be sold. <laughs> it could be. I mean, as long as, like, honestly, if, if Clive Barker's involved, yes. Um, and if he's not, I mean, he should be. So, although one movie of his, and I mean, we don't get to go off into a whole, this isn't a movie podcast, I guess, but uh, <laughs> that I, I think is a really good movie that not a lot of people have seen is Midnight Me Train. Oh. Uh, it's like one of Bradley Cooper's early roles when he was just getting into like being a, a movie star and uh, it's Vinnie Jones and him and uh, it, he's like a, uh, a writer and there's like someone murdering people on this train people are going missing on this train and uh, I think Vinnie Jones is like the silent guy that's taking these people his name's Mr. Oak or something he's named after wood or it's mahogany or something and um, anyway he has like this hammer he used to kill people and then Eventually, you find out where the train goes and why he's doing it, and uh, it's very interesting. But it's based yeah. on a Clyde Barker short story too. Really? Uh, oh, I'll check yeah. That out. I mean, Nightbreed's fun too. If you like that movie, I I, I discovered that it was actually filmed um, in Cam. I think it was Camrose. It was like a, it took two hours from where I was living. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the uh, few uh, roles you could. Like, I'm a huge fan of David Cronenberg, and he's an actor in it, which is something you don't see him do a lot of. So it's pretty cool. It's uh. It's a fun movie. It's like making monsters the heroes, which is kind of a unique thing at that time period. So. It was, yeah, it had some, I didn't care for the special effects, but there wasn't, uh, the story was so much more interesting. And yeah, was, I thought was, the serial killer, like the human serial killer, not to reveal who that was, but uh, yeah. the look of him was one of the most terrifying I've ever seen. That was really yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, really cool design. Really, really good job. Like they, it was, it was bizarre, but it was like, uh, you know, it it just didn't go the way I thought it was. Like when I saw the poster for, it, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll give this a shot. And then I was like, what is happening? <laughs> but it, it was cool. It was really cool. I just what was the one I was watching today? Actually, it's called the Horror Show. Oh, and it, watch his name. He's it, it's an old guy. He's in um the prequel for the thing. He plays like the old guy that's like leading the expedition. I think was he in the thing? Maybe, maybe not. But he's been in like alien and stuff. He plays like the robot that like gets its head ripped off or its torso ripped in half. By, like, in the first alien. one? Uh, I think it's the second one. Oh, Lance Maybe. Henderson? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> he's got mm-hmm. kind of like a pizza shaped head. <laughs> like <Yeah>. his hair. <laughs> he, was in, he was in Pumpkinhead and a lot of those movies back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Pumpkinhead. That's it. And he uh, he's in it. And it's he's a cop that is he just like arrested like this like insane serial killer who is like uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's a pretty good actor. He he was in Fifth uh, Fifth Element. He just plays like one of like the goofy kind of like cops or whatever. Hmm. Um, he plays a lot of bit roles, but uh, basically, Buddy is like Ed Gein on crack, <laughs> and he's just like so that like him and his partner like they go into like this warehouse to arrest him, and like there's dead cops inside that are like in a deep fryer, <laughs> and he's like eating people and stuff. And basically, the whole concept is really weird, but it's like this is kind of cool. So basically the whole premise of the story is Buddy gets executed. He's put through the electric chair and he dies. Mm-hmm. But he's like, oh, I vow to come back. And so his ghost does come back. So there's this like scientist who's very like short-lived and says there is some, and it's very vague. They don't actually go into it, but they say there, there's a phenomena where if that evil is an energy mm-hmm. and that if you electrocute his ghost, the way he was electrocuted when he died, it'll actually bring him back to life and you can kill him for good. It was really weird and cerebral. <laughs> I was like, this is so bizarre. <laughs> like, but I was like, I'm so hooked because that guy is like 
uh, what was his name? Henriksen? Lance Henriksen, yeah. He's he was so... Bishop and Alien 2 and 3. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, he's so fun to watch. And he's just, yeah. He's, uh... There's another good movie with him called Near Dark uh, by Catherine Bigelow. It's a vampire movie. He's really good in that. Dark. Near Dark, yeah. You're giving awesome. me all these ones we gotta watch. Uh, right? <laughs> well, we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll chat after the story. After the show. Oh yeah. <laughs> or our, uh, I'll send you some messages and we'll uh, we'll chat movies. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for being on, man. It was a great oh, pleasure to have you. Thank you. I really appreciate it, man. Oh, you know, I do. We'll, uh, Thanks for reaching out. Oh no problem. And we'll connect here soon. Uh, now that I'm back east. Hundred percent. Soon. Yeah, I'll meet you at the Hop Yard. It's my favorite place in LA. Where is it? The Hop Yard. It's on Goddard. They ever they oh, play records okay. there. You pick records out of a bin and they'll play it for the music in the store. And the food's really oh, serious? Good. Yeah, it's great. Oh hell, let me know when you're back in town. Here, that'd be awesome. I will. We'll hang out then. All right, man. Thank you so much and have a good you, night. Man. You too. All right, bye-bye. See ya. Bye. And that was my discussion with Don Watson. What a fun talk. Don is a really cool guy. Uh, and we obviously line on a lot of things. We had a lot of uh, laughs in that show and talked about a lot of interesting topics that I really enjoyed. So hope you did too. I hope it caused a nice distraction for you on this day. Hopefully it's a nice day where you are. Nice weather. It's getting to get nice out here. Uh, so hopefully it is where you are as well. Uh, stay tuned to social media for the announcement of our guest for next week as I'm doing this one way in advance, which I love to do because it gives me some time to uh, to get a good one. So hopefully somebody that is uh, worthwhile of the show will be on very soon, and I'll let you know about that on social media. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to the show on whatever medium you're listening to it on. Um, also, if you can, if you're on Apple or any of those ones where you can leave a review, please do so. Uh, that really helps get me out there and gets me one step closer towards that sweet, sweet Casper mattress, Stamps.com, Squarespace, or MeUndies money, which I desperately need. So... Uh, <laughs> and also be sure to check out X-Rated, the X-Men animated review show uh, with me and Davin but I will not keep you any longer thank you very much for tuning in I will see you in a fortnight my name is Andre Maiden it's been a real pleasure catch you next time